हेलो हेलो आई पर मैं movies are also playing okay great great yeah, okay thank you yeah yeah i will i will stop here thank you thank you is who you available with yon yeah i just joined yeah do you want to try your presentation um uh, i need to copy my presentation to this laptop uh, i think you can just go here Okay, okay, okay. And my probably he can start the session. They they don't have to. They will. They can check it when their talk comes. Okay. <clears throat> so good morning, and welcome to the second day of the meeting. The first session of today focuses on coronal magnetism, measurements, techniques, and coronal heating. I, Tanmay Samanta, and Megha Anand will chair this session. So first we request you all to remain muted all the time during the presentations and type your question in the chat box. You can also use raise hand to ask your question in the end of every talk. The raise of hand option can be seen in the bottom panel of the Zoom by clicking reaction option. So there are total five talks in this session, three invited and two solicited. The first talk will be given by Sarah Gibson from HAO. and she will be talking about coronal magnetic field measurement and models sara i'll give you a 5 minutes warning at 20 minutes sara please go ahead and start i just realized that if i share my screen i can't i don't know how to unmute so let me do that one more time <laughs> okay okay Okay. 
So thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, the picture on this introductory slide I have is, is one I put together some years ago as a way of visualizing how magnetism connects time and space from the sunspot cycle to twisted magnetic structures that erupt and drive space weather from the solar interior out through the heliosphere. And this title mentions both measurements and models of the corona's magnetic field. And my intention is to show how we can use models to understand the value of the measurements that we take. Um, I'm in particular going to be highlighting recent publications of two of my young colleagues, Ji Zhao, whose work will help us build some intuition into how ultraviolet and visible IR spectropolarimetry might be used in complementary ways. And also Marcel Cortado Albelo, whose work examines how coronal spectropolarimetric observations can be used to monitor the buildup of magnetic energy in the pre-eruption corona. So how do we measure magnetic fields in the corona? Well, in the infrared, physical process of Zeeman splitting results in circularly polarized light uh, so that the fraction of light polarized uh, in this manner is then proportional to the line of sight magnetic field strength. This mechanism favors longer wavelengths and it requires high telescope sensitivity and a chronograph. So it's a limb observation. It's been demonstrated in this paper by Hao Sheng, um, but generally it needs bigger telescopes than have been available. So we're talking a signal of one part in a thousand at best. And so there'll be more about this at the end of my talk. A more accessible to smaller telescope thing is the use of MHD waves to diagnose the plane of the sky component of the magnetic field. Uh, this can be done using Doppler observations. Uh, and I think we're gonna hear more about this from other speakers this session. Uh, later this session, Hui Tian is going to present some recent exciting results um, where an entire map of the plane of the sky magnetic field was reproduced using observations from the COMP telescope. So the COMP telescope makes daily global measurements in the iron 131047 angstrom line uh, in linearly polarized light which is much brighter uh, signal than circularly polarized light, 100 times brighter. Uh, at first glance, I think looking at this, it's hard to see the magnetic field in this image of linear polarization fraction. But it's the lack of polarization where things get interesting, where it's dark, because depolarization happens when the magnetic field is oriented along the line of sight, and also at a special angle known as the Van Fleck angle, which results in nulls in the linear polarization. I'm going to go into that in more in a moment, and I'll also talk about how this measurement might be used to diagnose topology of coronal magnetic fields. But you, first of all, let me look at this. This is so the linear polarization is broken into Stokes U and Stokes Q components. When they're summed in quadrature, you're talking about magnitude of linear polarization, but you can also use them to define an angle representing their vector direction, which is the so-called azimuth angle. This is maybe actually an easier thing to interpret in terms of plane of sky magnetic field direction. And you can see how the azimuth is showing the direction of this region of diverging fields. This is an observation from COMP. Um, so here you can see the vectors are showing you the direction of the, of the azimuth, but also there's a color coding. So black is radial, blue is a clockwise tilt from radial, and red is a counterclockwise. So, um, so you can see diverging fields here. Now it's for converging fields, it's complicated by the fact that when the magnetic vector crosses the Van Fleck angle, the polarization vector jumps by 90 degrees. So that uh, converging fields are a little counterintuitive. See how they're jumping from red to blue abruptly, when in fact this is a closed structure and converging magnetic field. But with the help of forward modeling, we can it becomes possible to look at observations like this from COMP and you can immediately see the closed and the open magnetic field structures. And so from this, we can see that azimuth provides an important diagnostic of non-radiality in particular, for example, of these diverging fields. Now the magnetic sensitivity seen in these comp linear polarization observations are due to the Hanley effect in combination with the physical process of resonance scattering. Uh, as it happens, this, this effect operates rather differently in different wavelength regimes and in particular at infrared versus ultraviolet wavelengths. So to get a deeper understanding of what's happening, let's start with that underlying process of resonance scattering before we introduce any magnetic field. This process is what happens when incident radiation from below the corona 
resonantly scatters with coronal ions. Light is then re-emitted, linear, linearly polarized in a plane perpendicular to the observer's line of sight. Now, since the corona is optically thin, this observed polarization vector is going to be a vector sum of all the polarization vectors of the scattered rays coming from that underlying chromospheric cap. And in, in what I'm going to be talking about today, I'm going to be assuming that that incident radiation is symmetric and uniform and unpolarized itself. The process can be understood in terms of a two-level atom with an unpolarized lower level, which has a resonant transition to a first excited level. And that two-level approximation is appropriate for what I'm going to talk about. I'm in particular Lyman alpha emission in the ultraviolet, but also as an approximation of 10747 iron 13 emission in the infrared. So I said that the light would be polarized perpendicular to the observer. That means uh, observer's line of sight, which means lying in the plane of sky. In the case of ultraviolet, we're looking at Lyman alpha, which has an electric dipole transition and results in linear polarization tangent to the limb. So you can see these blue vectors showing that direction. This resonance scattering polarization is created by an anisotropy of the incident radiation field. So as we move farther away from sun center, the atoms there have a higher polarization fraction because the sun has become more and more point light the further we get away from it. And the incident radiation becomes more and more anisotropic. And you can see that here in the fact that the polarization fraction is increasing with height. Now, in the case of ion 13, we still have that increase with height, the polarization fraction, but this is, now we're talking about so-called forbidden magnetic, di magnetic dipole transition. And this, because it's magnetic, it's not electric, results in a 90 degree rotation of polarization. So now, instead of those vectors being tangent to the limb, they're radial. They are, of course, still perpendicular to the observer's line of sight in the plane of the sky, but 90 degree shifted from the ultraviolet. So that's already one difference. Now, let's introduce a magnetic field, and we're going to start in the infrared. And this is where the Hanley effect begins to show up. But we talk about this as the saturated regime. And what we mean is that the magnetic field is strong enough that the Larmor frequency, which depends on the magnetic field, is big compared to the inverse lifetime of the atomic transition. So this depends both on the magnetic field strength in the corona, but also on the particular transition we're talking about. In the case of the iron 13, 10, 7, 4, 7 coronal line, the lifetime's very long, so the inverse lifetime is very short. So pretty much for all coronal magnetic field strengths, we are in the strong saturated regime, which means that the polarization effects are independent of the magnetic field. They do depend on magnetic geometry, basically the sort of thing I already talked about with the comp data regarding, regarding magnetic topology, plane of sky, direction. Okay, so for me, a picture is worth a thousand words in equations. So let's start with a picture of a magnetic flux rope to try to demonstrate what I'm talking about here. Okay, we're looking at an axis of a flux rope. Uh, the red arrows here are showing you that circulation around the axis in the plane of the sky. And this blue is showing you direction along the line of sight of the axial magnetic field in the flux rope. And here to the left, you can see the disk of the sun. So this is a model of a coronal structure like a large quiescent prominence cavity, for example. Okay, let's take this model and let's do some forward modeling. So here it is again, and uh, here you can see the vectors, the white vector showing the plane in the sky field direction. But now what I'm showing is in the grayscale is the fraction of linearly polarized light um, as the fraction of the linear polarized light. And I mentioned earlier, we're talking about a depolarization, right? So we start with the polarization from the resonance scattering, and in this saturating regime, two things can result in the complete depolarization of the light. When the magnetic field is completely aligned with the line of sight, the linear polarization drops to zero, so along the flux rope axis. And it also does it when the magnetic field is oriented at the Van Fleck angle relative to the radial, 54.7 degrees. And there it is at the Van Fleck angle. But you can also see the Van Fleck angle here if you imagine this, let's imagine this is the, the head of a rabbit peeking sideways over the limb of the sun, okay? So here in the rabbit's ears, that's the obvious place where you see the Van Fleck angle. Um, but you also see dark in the head of the rat, uh, rabbit, partly because it's uh, right at the center, it's axial, but also because there's uh, the magnetic field vector is crossing the Van Fleck angle as it rotates around the axis. 
And the reason why this all happens basically is related to geometric factors operating on the atomic alignment factor. And um, this paper by Ji Zhao from 2019 re really kind of breaks it all down and uh, so you can understand why that is. Okay, so here it is again. And now I'm showing you the azimuth direction as a green arrow on top of the white arrows, which are showing the magnetic field. And what you can see is that the green is either parallel to the magnetic field in the plane in the sky or perpendicular. Once you cross that Van Fleck angle, you, hopefully you can see that we're crossing, uh, we have green and white perpendicular to each other. Um, and the, this has this flip, again, has to do with the sign change in the atomic alignment. And again, I invite you to look at this paper to, for the details. So you can see right away, we've got a 90 degree ambiguity in the azimuthal direction of the linear polarization in these coronal IR measurements. But it's important to remember that if you have some sort of idea of what kind of magnetic structure we're looking at, for example, closed or open, it's often enough to resolve this ambiguity in a more global sense. Okay, so far I've been showing you a slice in the plane of the sky of forward modeled linear polarization but the corona of course is optically thin. So we have to consider the effects of line of sight integration on our signal. Well, it turns out that for the particular case I've been talking about, a flux row oriented along the line of sight, um, the, the effect, the, the, the signal really survives this integration with most of the information intact. In particular, I mentioned that the flux rope is a model for a quiescent prominence cavity. And what we found with comp is that cavities show up as these rabbit headed or lagomorphic structures systematically whenever there's a good, large, unobstructed cavity. And in this case, you're looking at the comp observations on the left. The chronograph occulter is here, this dark disk going to about 0.05 of a solar radius. And there's the cavity center. The green polarization vectors in COMP are doing exactly what the forward modeling predicts. They're either parallel or perpendicular to the plane of the sky field. There's that 90 degree flip from here to here. And the dark ears of the Fleck, Van Fleck angles are showing uh, between the observations and the models quite well. Here's another example of a COMP observation of a magnetic structure where the Observation is doing exactly what is predicted for a model magnetic field, despite the fact that we're integrating along the line of sight. In this case, a pseudo streamer, here's our magnetic uh, model, with quadrupolar topology and a magnetic null right there, results in Van Fleck surfaces coming to a point at the magnetic null, and the comp observations of a pseudo streamer are showing this beautifully. So, so this is what I mean about how even in the saturated regime of the Hanley effect, in the infrared, where there's no direct information about magnetic field strength, the linear polarization informs us about the magnetic field direction and the topology. But now let's consider the unsaturated regime, which is something that might be observed in the ultraviolet. Here we're considering a two-level atom in which the inverse lifetime of the transition is such that the Larmor frequency associated with coronal magnetic field strengths might in fact be relatively small. So we can think of the Hanley effect by approximating the excited atom as a damped oscillator, where the Larmor frequency then shows us the precession motion, you can kind of see it here, around the magnetic field vector. This motion is now directly related to the magnetic field strength through the Larmor frequency. And the damping is proportional to the finite lifetime tau of the upper level of the atomic transition. It's shown here, you can see the shrinking red polarization magnitude as it dims. So you can start to see that in this unsaturated regime, there's a sweet spot of magnetic field strength that depends on the atomic transition under consideration. If the field strength is too small, like here, the damping and the rotation may be too small to notice. But if it gets too big, it actually enters that saturated regime that we've already talked about um, and that is the, actually the constant domain in the infrared. Okay, again, let's use forward modeling to demonstrate this. On the left, I've got that same magnetic flux rope representation. To remind you, blue here means that we're looking at a magnetic field pointing along the axis, aligned with our line of sight. And then these red arrows are showing you the circulation in the plane of the sky. 
And then on these three gray boxes, it's forward modeled linear polarization um, in Lyman alpha for three choices of axial magnetic field strength, 10, 50, and 100 Gauss. And as you can see that as we increase the field strength, the fraction of linearly polarized light decreases, depolarizes, and you might be able to see that the orientation of those green vectors is rotating until we start to see that rabbit's head again as we approach saturation. It's probably easier to see this in color. So again, on the left, this is just the, the magnetic model for guidance. But on the right, we're forward modeling linear polarization azimuth or direction, which is what we saw in those green arrows, except now we're, we're taking the number of degrees rotation and, and demonstrating it with a color table. Okay, so the more blue in these three right-hand images, the stronger the line of sight magnetic field. And so you can see that as we increase the magnetic field, it's getting more and more blue. So we have a diagnostic of line of sight magnetic field strength in the linear polarization. This red is showing up because we're starting to hit some of those geometric effects that were associated with the saturated regime, which is where we ultimately are gonna end up. The red and the blue, again, in these three images are just showing you that tilt from the resonance scattering standard orientation of tangent to the limb. So white would be no tilt, that's sort of, we can see here, and then and it's completely tangent, and then we start to tilt in the blue and the red. And when we crank up the magnetic field still further, we sat, converge on the saturated regime entirely. From here on, no matter how we increase the field, the signal of both the linear polarization magnitude, which is this gray image here, and direction or azimuth, which is this red blue image, won't change anymore. At that point, the linear polarization is either parallel or perpendicular to the plane of the sky, or it vanishes at the Van Fleck angle or the line of sight, that when the field is oriented along the line of sight. So here's a movie where we increase magnetic field and the magnetic field along the axis of the flux rope from unsaturated to saturated. So one more time, you can see when we end up, we're there with our rabbit's head. And now this is azimuth. So again, color is, is showing you the tilt. And while it's still unsaturated, you've got this diagnostic of the line of sight magnetic field strength. And I'll, I'll point out that the, the, the values of magnetic field strength that we use to saturate in this final image are unrealistic. We're talking a million degrees Gauss. I mean, I mean a million Gauss rather, sorry, a million Gauss. And that's because we need that strength relative to the atomic transition lifetime. And that's what matters here. And we don't expect Lyman alpha to saturate for coronal magnetic field strength, which is why it's a really nice diagnostic. Here's a picture showing you that the artificially saturated Lyman alpha on the left and the pretty much always saturated iron 13 on the right um, in terms of linear polarization fraction look pretty much the same. If you look close though, maybe you can see that the green arrows showing the azimuth direction are perpendicular to each other. And so this, they're, they're highly complementary. And in fact, this presents another possible way other than using global models or interpretation for diagnosing the location of the Van Fleck angle when there's a 90 degree jump, because it's gonna happen in the same place in these two cases, but one is gonna jump in one direction and the other in the other. Okay, so let's move on to a slightly different topic. So ultraviolet spectral polarimetry, which is what I've been showing you with the unsaturated Hollering regime, it diagnoses more than just the magnetic field. So to get a sense of how this may impact our unsaturated um, Hanley UV measurements or observations interpretation, we made use of a model of a coronal streamer. It's an analytic solution combining a magnetostatic bulk current model with stress-free current sheets, both at the equator um, and the boundary around the streamer. It captures a plasma distribution, so density and temperature, and a basically dipolar magnetic field uh, of the solar corona, for example, during solar minimum. And for the purpose of this study, we also added field aligned outflow um, and we matched velocity, density, and temperature <laughs> observations. So we took this physical state description and forward modeled the Hanley effect for Lyman alpha, um, exactly the same way we did for the flux rope model. So let me just show it. There you can see. So in this case, I don't have- um, oh, Five more minutes. Okay. Um, and so what you're seeing here is what we saw before, which is basically the saturation of the Hanley effect. Now, 
I mentioned that spectral polarimetry diagnoses more than magnetic field. For this, we have to go back to our initial description of resonance scattering. Um, this upper left-hand image is showing that. You'll recall this physical process involved a resonance between the incident radiation from below, that's these red and green spectra, and the coronal ions, which is blue. The effects we're gonna talk about now are symmetry breaking mechanisms. The first one is non-radial outflow. So the magnetic field and velocity are slanted, you can see. So the resonance between the blue and the red is going to be different than the resonance between this other side, the green. As a result, the amplitude of the scattered intensity, both polarized and unpolarized, decreases in the wing of the incident radiation line on this left-hand side. This is so-called Doppler dimming. But the direction of linear polarization doesn't change, except remember we're integrating the line of sight and the velocity is non-radial, so the effect becomes quite large and the direction of the linear polarization in fact rotates compared to the case with radial velocity. Another symmetry breaking effect is caused by anisotropy in the kinetic temperature in the solar wind, which results in a broader line profile in the perpendicular direction to the magnetic field than the parallel direction. So resonance scattering then is more effective in the parallel uh, direction, and the linear polarization is asymmetric in the integration along the line of sight. And once again, we get a rotation of polarization in the direction where the kinetic temperature is larger and the line width is bigger. And these effects can happen in tandem and have a relation, they have a relationship to magnetic field because it's generally the direction of the flow. But the interesting thing is that these different effects dominate in different regions. Uh, and so we demonstrate this with the model. And you can see the azimuth for the case of a very small magnetic field. So for the moment, forget the Hanley effect. What we're seeing, whoops, is the effect of these symmetry breaking processes. Um, so you can see azimuth on the left when there's neither anisotropy or outflow. When we have outflow, you can see that where the field and flow start to become, where they're radial, it's white, meaning there's no tilt. But when there's an curves, we do see the effect. If we have anisotropy, we get, a, again, a sensitivity of the magnetic field, but in this case, it's broadening in the direction perpendicular to the field, so it's not surprising that, you see this is blue and this is red, it's going in the opposite direction. Now here's the two together. And what's cool here is that you can see that the ion anisotropy of temperature is a larger role at low heights, and the Doppler dimming, where it's higher velocities of the outflow, is a larger at high heights. And there's this place where they switch, which is pretty neat. Now, if we turn on our magnetic field, and now we're not doing million gauss, we're using kind of normal coronal fields, we get this little kind of divot of magnetic effect in the Hanley effect down low. And so when you put them all together, you see that these different effects take place in different parts of the corona. Okay, I have one last thing I wanna talk about, shifting gears back to the infrared, and ask the question, how do we use the information we get from coronal spectral polarimetry to answer the question of how um, free energy builds in the corona. So Marcel Corchara Abele, who was a summer student with me for several years and is now a first year grad student at University of Colorado, took a simulation of Yuhong Fans of a flux rope, not unlike the one we talked about before, and forward modeled that lagomorph or rabbit headed figure in uh, linear polarization. So what he asked was, if you look at the free energy of a system, and in this case, there is a, a, a flux rope that's building before and are ultimately erupting. Um, if you look at the difference between this time varying energized system and a potential field with the same boundary conditions, can the observational diagnostics monitor that increase and even predict the likelihood of eruption? And he quantified non-potentiality by forward modeling the simulated uh, structure versus the potential structure, taking their difference. And he did it for both linear polarization and circular polarization. And the power here is that one could take observations of the energized system and of the boundary condition of the sun and come up with the potential and reproduce this observationally. But he was doing this with an idealized case with the intention of asking whether the non-potentiality in the observed signal tracked the free energy. And in fact, it did. This is a difference between the linear polarization and the circular polarization, and this is the free energy. And you can see as the flux rope emerges, the structure tracks, both structures, linear and circular, track the free energy. 
Um, and he quantified a non-potentiality index in a 1D term, which is essentially uh, summing over that 2D image. And he got a quantity that is well correlated with the increase in free energy. And in particular, this is true, of course, in the circular polarization, making it uh, an interesting target uh, for future analyses with observations. So to wrap up, much of what I've been showing you is forward modeling. And this is because we need new telescopes to observe some of the quantities I talked about. In the IR, we need the big telescopes. We need the DKIST and the COSMO with their complementary views of the small structure and the global corona. We need uh, the, the, the long continuous observations, for example, that we would get from the VELC telescope on Aditya, which also has the low background noise made possible in space. And the future of UV spectral polarimetry is a bit more uncertain. There have been proposals, notably out of Europe and China, and I'm optimistic that we can also see a way forward in this new frontier, but it's still question. So to conclude, coronal spectral polarimetry is a powerful tool for diagnosing non-potentiality and other coronal magnetic scientific targets. The existing observations we have in visible IR is one path, uh, and the analysis I showed of Marcel as could equally apply to ultraviolet spectral polarimetry uh, using the quantification of line of sight field from the, uh, in the unsaturated Hanley regime. And UV spectral polarimetry is also a diagnostic of effects like Doppler dimming it and the temperature anisotropy in the solar wind. And the recent work of Ji Zhao shows how these effects may operate in spatially isolated ways in the coronal because the field is strong down low and the wind is strong up high. Marcel's non-potentiality index can be calculated from observations and used to identify hot spots of stored free energy. And it would be desirable to apply this technique to real observations, either in the UV or the IR, which of course would require new telescopes, not yet in operation, but hopefully soon. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for a wonderful detailed overview on the coronal magnetic field measurements using IR and UV spectropolarimetry. So let's take questions now. And I don't see the I, I don't see hands up or anything. So I guess you'll read the questions if somebody writes it. Oh. Maybe there are already two questions. I have raised a hand. Uh, this is the Biendu. I don't know if they can see it. Yeah, you can ask your question. Um, Sarah, this is the Biendu. So thank you for a wonderful talk. I learned quite a lot from your talk. Uh, so a question regarding uh, the applicability of this to, to infer fields from, from coronal magnetic field observations. If you look at the typical uh, relaxation time scales of magnetic fields in the corona uh, uh, based on the alvanic time scale, uh, I think for for white sun loops, large scale structures, uh, probably coronal magnetometry is okay because you, you can, you know, you need to do uh, scans for a long time, maybe one hour or so to get a good signal to noise. But for dynamic flux systems where, where, where stuff is emerging rapidly or there is a rapid dynamics going on, uh, do you believe that, uh, that coronal magnetometry can in fact infer the underlying flux loop topology? Is it possible to do so? Um, yeah, so of course it really depends on the, uh, oops, it depends on the type of telescope we're talking about. For the observations that I was talking about with the comp or the, um, let me see if I can bring it up again, or the Cosmo or, uh, here we go, some of these things. These, these telescopes, for example, there's no scanning involved. These are images, right. so they're plain okay. images. Um, and, uh, and the time scales that, um, for example, in developing Cosmo, the time scales in the um, requirements setup are absolutely capable of, of looking at the uh, the the um, measuring observations. Uh, there was a paper by Yuhong Fan and co-authors forward modeling a simulated CME eruption, dynamic eruption, and putting in realistic signal to noise for the Cosmo telescope to determine whether the um, the field strength could be measured uh, versus time, and, and shown that that was possible. So it, you know, for the for the very fast, um, uh, so the DKIS, for example, also uh, has a small field of view, but it's got a tremendous light gathering capability, and so it's going to be able to do a high time varying things, I think, very well indeed. All right, great to know that this is a potentially exciting field. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Sampurna, you can ask your question. Yeah. 
thank you, Sarah. This is Sampurna here. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, and thank you also for uh, citing Mega et al. work. Uh, I'm just curious, you talked about uh, only the two lines, hydrogen one Lyman alpha line and the uh, iron 13 line. Uh, are there any other uh, coronal lines that you are looking at uh, for uh, handle effect diagnostics? Absolutely. So um, in, uh, in, in the DKIST with the, the, the NERSP uh, in, uh, instruments, as well as in the upgrade of COMP that's being done, um, other visible uh, infrared lines can be looked at. There are silicon lines that are interesting. Uh, linear polarization can be looked at in the green line. Um, in the ultraviolet, one of the ones we, we investigated was um, oxygen-6. Um, and it was very interesting because what we found was we basically, uh, I don't know if I can really show this, but uh, we basically looked at signal to noise in the presence of scattering. And it turns out oxygen-6 is an interesting line in the ultraviolet. It's actually more sensitive to the Hanley effect than the Lyman alpha. But when you take into consideration collisions, it creates a serious noise problem. So Lyman alpha was the one that actually gave us good signal to noise. So yes, the answer is yes. And, and, and forward modeling is a way of kind of getting at which ones are interesting. And I'm very much looking forward to some of the visible IR diagnostics that can done, be done with uh, the new telescopes in the next year or two. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have just another question. The Lyman alpha line is a very strong line. Do you take into account uh, transfer effects or it is just treated uh, using the single scattering and uh, line of sight integration? Yes, that we're, we're, it's, it's a fairly simplified model in, in, in our forward modeling, uh, which nevertheless can, can reproduce the, the Hanley and the uh, Doppler dimming and the, the uh, anisotropy. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Arnab, you can ask your question. Okay, Sara, this is Arnab. Uh, so many of the coronal flux loops appear to have a twisted appearance and uh, even uh, non-potentiality and free energy will depend very much on the amount of twist in the magnetic field. So the examples which you showed, uh, they do not show any twist. So by the methods which you have described, is it possible to look for the signature of twist in the magnetic field if it is present? That's a really interesting question because really what I was showing was a linear scaling where we were essentially uh, cranking up the strength of the line of sight field in this, this simple flux rope model. Um, but for that, I think we would need to do uh, more detailed modeling uh, which uh, of a, a particular magnetic structure. And ideally you'd be able to bring together multiple observations like this to um, uh, to constrain the three-dimensional structure of the magnetic field. But still, nevertheless, the, the free energy is, if you think about a flux rope, um, as, so think of a potential arcade and now put in a, a twist along the axis, right? The axial component there is a measure of how energized that flux rope is. Uh, because time constraints, <laughs> Next talk. Uh, thank you, Sarah. I request the participants to continue their chats in the chat box and also on the Slack channel. Okay. Uh, let's now welcome Vaibhavan from Aries. Uh, he'll be presenting a talk on forward modeling of magnetohydrodynamic waves in the solar atmosphere. Uh, Vaibhav, I'll remind you of the time at about 12 minutes. Okay, over to Vaibhav. Okay, just a minute. Um, okay. Yeah, can, uh, am I audible and can you see my screen? Hello. Yes, yeah, 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 okay. Uh, thank you, Megha. So I will talk about forward modeling of MHD waves in the solar atmosphere. So in this talk, I will uh, focus uh, only on the uh, transverse MHD waves. So going back to the history of uh, trans observation of transverse waves in the solar atmosphere, um, some of the earliest signature uh, suggest the presence of these waves uh, due to the uh, non-thermal broadening that, that are observed in the emission lines as seen in this observation. So here we see that uh, uh, the non-thermal uh, broadening increases as, as one goes away uh, from the solar line and then it uh, levels off. 
and uh, it was thought to be a signature of elfin waves propagation and damping in the solar corona. So uh, I term it as the indirect signatures because uh, in these observations there are no direct measurements measurements of the, uh, displacements and uh, velocity amplitudes. However, later on after the advent of PRAISE and STO and ICE, uh, we do see the direct signature of uh, transverse waves in the solar atmosphere. For example, here we do see displacements of the coronal loops in response to a shock wave. Uh, and uh, there have been uh, now uh, several uh, uh, observations of uh, uh, direct signatures of uh, uh, transverse waves in the solar atmosphere. Now, these waves are not only uh, confined to a particular active region or to a particular region in a sun, uh, rather they are found uh, everywhere. And Sarah has also shown this movie of COMP, and COMP has really established the ubiquity of these waves in the solar atmosphere. And these waves are seen as uh, outward propagating Doppler velocity fluctuations. And you see that they are uh, present everywhere. This is a good thing because uh, then uh, they can diagnose the properties of plasma and the global uh, properties of plasma in the, uh, in, in the global corona. So, but uh, um, it was observed that the uh, uh, energy flux carried by these waves by uh, estimating uh, the resolved values of Doppler velocities were uh, around four orders of magnitude less than what is required for coronal heating. And uh, this is also much uh, smaller than uh, the energy flux uh, measured from other observatories such as SDO and AIA. So the question here is where the uh, energy is going, why we do not see uh, energies, uh, 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 the, the energy flux of around 100 watt per meter square from the comp observation. Uh, on the other hand, we also uh, do see a large non-thermal line bits um, from these uh, spectroscopic observations, so it also needs an explanation. In addition to that, since these waves are, uh, are present globally, they also uh, show some global spectroscopic features, or, uh, and one of them is the wedge-shaped correlation between RMS Doppler velocities and non-thermal line bits. And here we see a, a nice correlation between them. And uh, McIntosh and Dpointy try to explain this correlation in terms of line of sight superposition of uh, different polarization of alpha and waves moving in the solar atmosphere. Uh, however, in, to explain this wedge shape correlation, they had to add extra non thermal line width of 14 kilometer per second, uh, whose origin was not known. So, this serves as a motivation for us uh, uh, to study uh, the the problem of uh, uh, the propagation of transverse wave in solar atmosphere in more details by, construct, uh, by constructing such this is which is also transversely inhomogeneous. Now, why do we choose uh, transverse inhomogeneity? Because in the real observation, we do observed that the plasma is transversely inhomogeneous. For example, in this uh, observation by SDOAI at the, uh, in, in the northern uh, pole, we do see transverse inhomogeneities in the density. So this, uh, uh, the, the inclusion of transverse inhomogeneities in our model is observationally motivated. Uh, now we perform ideal uh, MHD simulation to keep the thing simple. And uh, we excited waves at the bottom boundary, and then these waves propagate upward, and somewhere in the middle of simulation domain, uh, uh, they uh, form this type of uh, uh, velocity uh, patterns. And uh, just by looking at the movie, you can make out that we are using a multi-frequency uh, velocity driver, because there is not one frequency here. And because of that, uh, uh, we, do see, uh, we do see that the velocity forms a lissagious uh, uh, pattern. And on the top of that, we also do see the distortion of uh, the flux tube structure. This is due to the generation of turbulence because of phase mixing uh, that, that happens uh, due to the varying uh, uh, and speed inside and outside these flux tube structures. So uh, now the next, uh, next uh, um, idea here is to, do the, to perform the forward modeling because simulation as such will not uh, give uh, uh, the information of the of the quantities that we observe, because uh, what we observe is the emission. So somehow uh, the uh, the information of the density and temperature that we get from the simulation has to be converted into emission. And this uh, this is done uh, by employing the uh, method of forward modeling. And uh, forward modeling also take into account the line of sight integration. And since corona is optically thin, so we uh, we 
we do have a, a lot of line of sight integration uh, in in in, uh, in solar corona and therefore uh, depending on the uh, line of sight chosen the forward modeling will change uh, a 3d uh, magnetic uh, a 3d msd a 3d cube to a 2d projected image so this is a way to create a synthetic observations from the msd simulation so we performed a forward modeling for iron 13 emission line because we wanted to study the or we wanted to simulate the behavior of uh, wave propagation uh, in the comp and uh, So, Vaibhav, we are not able to hear you. Vaibhav? Can anybody hear him? No, we, we, I cannot also hear him. Vaibhav, the screen is frozen. Yeah. I think his connection is I think he's, he's dropped out of Zoom. Please just wait for a minute. Uh, Tanmay, this is Devi here. If you have his phone number, just give him a call to see what. Yeah. 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 Can you have his number? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, is that web hub? Yeah. Yeah, am I audible now? Start sharing now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just a minute. This is in uh, in two minutes. Yeah, yeah, just a minute. Let me share it. So there was a data drop. I'm very sorry for that. So I will just go to the... Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think, uh, is it full screen now? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, we uh, could reproduce this uh, wedge shape correlation, and then we did uh, a simulation with different uh, velocity amplitude. And then again, uh, we do see that these uh, nicely follow this wedge shape correlation as seen in the observation. So the two take home messages from here is that uh, the Doppler velocities are quite small. I mean, they are under resolved and the two waves uh, and the non-thermal line widths are quite large and therefore two waves amplitudes are hidden in the non-thermal line widths. We also could reproduce the observed uh, nature of variation of non-thermal line widths with uh, uh, height uh, because we see that in observation, the non-thermal line width increases. Uh, and uh, this is also what we see, uh, what we could reproduce from uh, our simulations. Next is uh, to understand the energy uh, discrepancy. As I uh, as I explained that uh, the comp uh, un, uh, the, the energy flux estimated uh, from comp was quite small and uh, was uh, two to three to four orders of magnitude less than what is expected. And similarly, we estimated the energies from forward modeling. This is something that an observer would have observed from synthetic observation. And in the left, we see the true wave energy flux. And we find that there is a, a discrepancy of uh, two to three orders of uh, magnitude. So uh, we, uh, so I would, uh, so uh, we concluded that the line of sight superposition affects the observed Doppler velocity amplitudes. And again, the two waves amplitude are hidden in non-thermal line waves. So we need a relation between non-thermal line waves and the true wave uh, amplitude, and to understand at, so that to bridge the gap between 
the energy is estimated from forward modeling and MSP simulation. So uh, to do uh, to understand this, we need to go back uh, three decades uh, back where uh, people were using these relationships, and we found that uh, in our uh, simulation. Uh, the non-thermal line waves are greater than or equal to uh, RMS velocities instead of less than or equal to as claimed in the previous studies. And, uh, um, and we, we also did some analytical calculation and confirmed it with numerical simulation. And we found that the non-thermal line waves are equal to RMS velocities if wave amplitudes are small. Uh, and if wave amplitudes are large, then uh, we get uh, asymmetric line profiles. Uh, because of the choice of random segments, because uh, uh, the corona is optically thin, as well as the development of turbulence. And these two things uh, uh, will increase the line width further. So for large wave amplitude, we have non-thermal line width greater than uh, RMS velocities. So uh, in general, energies estimated from non-thermal line widths are and uh, uh, will be much, much smaller if one uses non-thermal line widths as a measure of RMS velocities at least for large wave amplitudes. But this is also not a true picture because here we are assuming the filling factor to be one, but in, in reality, the filling factor will not be one. And this is now something that we are doing right now uh, to estimate the filling factor using synthetic observation. So once the filling factor is known, then we can estimate the true energies which have been carried by these waves. So in, the, in, in conclusion, I would like to say that these turbulent wave models are able to reproduce, uh, are able to reproduce some of the spectroscopic features of uh, of uh, uh, of the solar corona, and uh, uh, some uh, one of them is like best shape correlation, increase of non-thermal line width with height, and uh, could also explain the energy discrepancy of two to three orders of magnitude. And uh, we also find that large amplitude alpenic waves can also generate asymmetries in the observed spectra, which might be observed by the future spectrograph such as RJP or DCAST. So thank you. I will stop here. And again, sorry for the interruption. This session is open for questions and comments. Please raise your hand. Okay, we go ahead. Unmute yourself and ask the question. Thank you for the last talk, Matt. Um, I have a question regarding your the last point of your conclusion. Here you say that the orphan waves can generate a symmetry of the observed spectral line profiles. Um, yes. uh, have you estimated the magnitude of this asymmetry? How yes, can, yes, um, yes. Yeah, the, how, do, how does this asymmetry compare with the asymmetry caused by like uh, flows in yes. the yes. Yes. direction? Yes. 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 yes, so in the flows, the asymmetry, uh, the, the, the second component, if we assume that there are only two components, the second component is around, uh, in fact, more than 100 kilometers per second, while the a and the amount of asymmetries like R minus B divided by I uh, is also uh, quite large in case of flows. But uh, in case of, uh, uh, in case in our simulation, only for the large amplitudes, uh, this is uh, how it looks. Uh, the, a the, the most of the asymmetry is uh, concentrated around 40 to 50 kilometer per second. The second component is speaking around 40 to 50 kilometer per second. So it is certainly less than what we observe in the flows. And as well as the, uh, the magnitude of asymmetry is also quite small. It's, it's, it's like 0.3 or 0.4 at the, uh, at the most. Uh, so if we also have this uh, plots here. So you can see that this is also, so it is R minus B uh, by I divide uh, and as a function of velocities. So in the flows, we only see like one uh, one uh, uh, one uh, quadrant uh, here. Uh, but in uh, in the case of uh, alpha wave, we uh, uh, we do see uh, both quadrants. And here uh, you can see that R minus B by I at the most uh, go up to 0 0.2, which is smaller than what we see in flows. So yeah. Hello. We. Oui. You have to unmute yourself if you want to ask anything. Yeah, uh, I just want to thank you okay. for the explanation. Okay. Hey, uh, Binod, uh, go ahead and ask your question. Ah, yes, this is Binod Krishan. Um, uh, yes. You have considered an inhomogeneous system. Yes. Uh, and in such a system, the transverse waves and the longitudinal waves get coupled. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. We do see the signatures of uh, longitudinal wave also. Wait, let me show. Uh, 
So they I mean, were, you, are you able to uh, distinguish between them or you are uh, observing uh, some uh, mixture of these groups? So right now we are observing. In your simulation. So in, in our simulation, indeed, uh, we do see, let, let me, let me uh, find that uh, plot uh, where we do see, uh, um, so you are right, in, in homogeneous system, the waves are coupled. Uh, even though if you uh, excite purely transverse uh, a wave, yeah. uh, you will also get uh, um, a longitudinal uh, a longitudinal perturbation, that means perturbation along the magnetic field lines. And uh, yeah, so here uh, it is. So you see, uh, in addition to the transverse uh, velocity amplitude, we do see uh, the velocity amplitude of around five kilometer per second along uh, the magnetic fields. Uh, and these are the longitudinal uh, longitudinal components. So we do see it in our simulation, but since we are performing forward modeling in a direction perpendicular to the uh, perpendicular to the uh, to, to the uh, length of the flux tube, so therefore uh, these flows uh, have not affected the estimation of non-thermal line widths in our simulation. But then in, in, in reality, they would affect, but here you can see the uh, you, you can see the comparison. It is like five kilometer per second. Uh, and 26 kilometer per second is the amount of uh, transverse wave amplitude. So it is five by 26, around 20% of uh, the strength. I mean, yeah, so 20% so of uh, the, um, the the magnitude of uh, the longitudinal oscillation is like 20% of uh, the transverse oscillation. So, yeah, yeah, so I we do see that. Uh, it would help to also measure the density fluctuations. Yes, we do see uh, the density. Actually, it is also observed. Um, yeah. For example, in, in observations, I think I also have that. Uh, yeah, so you see in observation, people have seen the coexistence of slow and alpenic waves. So where uh, we do see alpenic waves from the comp, we also do see slow waves. So it could it could happen that uh, uh, these uh, uh, density, these uh, longitudinal perturbation could be driving this density fluctuation. But then I have to check it from our uh, observe uh, from uh, our mm -hmm. MSD simulation. Yeah. So this is like uh, I mean the future task that I had in mind. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we need to go ahead. And if you have any further question and comments, please post in Slack channel. And so thank you, Vaibhav, and we thank you. Well, move forward to the next talk. So next talk is an invited talk given by, will be given by Hao Sang Lin, and he will be talking about corner spectroscopy and spectroparametry. Hao Sang, please uh, go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay, your uh, let me start the sharing. I'll give you a warning of five minutes at 20 minutes. Okay. Can you see the, the presentation? Yeah, it looks fine. Yeah. Good. All right, thank you. And uh, first, I would like to thank the organizer for this invitation to uh, talk about uh, the, the subject of coronal spectroscopy and spectroperimetry. And that's a pretty broad subject, so I, I thought I would try to uh, focus the talk on more on how do we use this tool to de decipher the three-dimensional structure of the coronal magnetic field. After all, that's that's the what everybody need, wants to know, uh, so we can understand how the uh, solar corona works, how the eruption works. So here is an outline of what I will try to uh, present, and uh, uh, I'll talk uh, a little bit. Well, actually, not at all about the physics of us uh, coronal emission information and how do we interpret them? Uh, because I knew I can count on Sarah to give a very nice. Uh, review of this subject. And uh, I'll try to go through the, the current state of the field, the observations, uh, the instrumentation that's been done, uh, the science that we could do already, and, and new projects uh, that's coming online and uh, what we can expect from them. Uh, but what I really want to focus on is how to use these observations when they become available, new observation. We already have the comp observation available. 
But the new instrument, how, how can we use these new tools uh, and to, to understand and, uh, the solar corona using tomography? And at the end of the talk, I hope uh, you, you go away and, uh, and, and convinced that we can actually measure the three-dimensional structure of the solar corona using uh, spectroscopy and spectropolymetry of the uh, coronary emission line. Um, so that's my one slide physics of polarized uh, coronal emission line spectra. Uh, so jumping around. And basically, as, uh, as Sarah, uh, uh, presented, it's a resonance scattering of a highly ionized atom uh, in the solar corona, and that's uh, a scattering the photospheric uh, irradiation, uh, radiation from the photosphere, and, and, and in the process, the polarization state is modified by the local magnetic field in the solar corona. And so there's a list of uh, the uh, reference that if you are interested, you can uh, go look up. And uh, uh, the how do we interpret this uh, uh, observed polarization signal? And uh, uh, it's linear polarization that's a, that would give us the direction of the magnetic field, uh, transverse magnetic field direction in the plane of the sky. And the circular polarization, of course, is a, uh, proportional to the line of sight components of the magnetic field if we can only see the signal coming from a single um, a scattering atom. And of course, that's not, all, that's not the case. But in any case, uh, the, the field started around 1990, early 1990, and mostly, I think, uh, um, revived by Jeff Cohen when he uh, started uh, looking for uh, the coronal di diagnostics using a spectral line uh, in the visible and infrared. So there was the early eclipse um, expedition and taking the new toys we had, the infrared cameras that was just becoming available to, to, to the astronomers. Um, and did uh, the, this figure here is the 1994 solar eclipse, I believe, in Chile and uh, where he was showing the um, uh, the spectrum um, of the solar corona and between one and 1.5 micron. And that's where when the silicon 10, 1.43 micron line was first discovered. And here you can see, of course, the helium 10A30, the, the 10, uh, helium th uh, iron 13, 10, 10, 7, 4, 7 lines uh, that show up prominently in the solar corona. And that's a long time ago. And now uh, we have, just a few years ago, a new uh, uh, expedition uh, during the eclipse looking for spectral line from uh, in the mid-infrared. So this lower panel here is just the uh, spectral line all the way out to 3.9 micro, uh, where we have a silicon line, line that we believe is, uh, uh, has a very powerful diagnostic capability for measuring coronal magnetic field. And on the lower left is the um, uh, EUV slit plus spectroscopy uh, from um, Marshall Space Flight Center. And uh, you can see the accompanying uh, coronal emission line that's in the, in the EUV. And so with all this new observation, new interest, then um, those, these are spectral line, just spectroscopy. And of course, for magnetic field, we really need to do spectral polarimetry. And while I was looking for example of uh, spectral polarimetry, a uh, resolved spectral line, just realized that it's been 20 years and uh, these are still the only resolved uh, circular polarization spectra of the corona. And last one, this one, this panel here at the lower left is uh, uh, observation from Haria Klein in 2004, and that shows the first, and I guess uh, the only coronal magnetograph um, that's in existence in existence today. And I, I, I'm, I'm sure this is going to change very soon uh, 
uh, this year with ATS, uh, ATS TD kids coming online, uh, hopefully this year, then we will change this situation. But anyway, for spectral polarimetry with a resolved spectral line, these are the only data we have so far. And that shows how difficult it is to, to try to observe the coronal uh, Stokes V circular polarization of the coronal emission line. And of course, circuit linear polarization, their signal is 100 times stronger, and we can easily observe them even with a small telescope today. Right? And that's what we have now from COMP. And uh, Sarah went through uh, many examples and new, new observations also uh, using the COMP data. Uh, here is to use the lower left is to use the uh, uh, seismology, the oven wave to diagnose uh, the strength of the magnetic field. Uh, on the right, this is again the uh, pseudo streamer uh, and forward model of the linear polarization signal uh, that we think we can observe, and that's very nicely uh, verified by the COMP observation. And it really showcase how powerful these diagnostics are. And these are forward model. We need to know, uh, propose a magnetic field model of the corona first, and then try to see, knowing how the, uh, the emission line behave, and we can predict what they should look like and go look for, observe, go observe them and see if we can prove that the model is correct. Turns out our, I think we are doing pretty good with this. And so that's, that's the data we have and what we can do already. It's very exciting compared with 20 years ago when we started this business, uh, the modern observation of the coronal uh, magnetic field. So now there's a whole suite of instruments coming online. Uh, uh, UCOMP, upgrade COMP uh, that uh, uh, HEO is working on. I, my understanding is it's already been installed in Mauna Loa and should be coming online very soon. Um, and Maxim is a project that I, I'm doing uh, uh, that's um, uh, a small chronograph that I'm building uh, as a prototype for future space mission. DKIS, of course, everybody knows. And uh, uh, Aditya, uh, this, uh, the Indian Euro space program, I think is going to be very exciting. Uh, that um, will give us a lot of new information. And Cosmo is a one and a half meter um, large chronograph that HAO is, is pushing to build. Uh, the funding is now available for site survey, but the construction funding is not available yet. So I'll show a little bit about the first three projects since they are real, um, being uh, built right now. This is UCOMP and basically upper right is the uh, Leo filter, the new Leo filter. And what it does is it, is it expand on the capability of COMP and to expand wavelength, many spectral line coverage now. Uh, I think the blues are the new spectral line that it will cover. It's also going to increase the field of view coverage uh, from one point, about 1 1.4 uh, solar radii from disk center to two solar radii above the, uh, from disk center. And the large field of view coverage is very important for what we are trying to do here. This one is uh, some rendering of the instrument I'm trying to build. And <clears throat> this is uh, a spectrograph. So COMP is a uh, filter graph. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to build spectrograph with the resolved uh, spectral line. And, but using, as you all know, the uh, spectrograph is very inefficient when you are trying to map a large area. So this design is to use multiple slit, massively multiplex. So in the case of this chronograph here, it's a 15 centimeter chronograph. I'm trying to put in a hundred slits uh, to cover a, a one degree field of view, right? So it's a hundred times faster than a single slit instrument. And SPICE, this one in the middle, lower middle, is, is a full disk spectral polarimeter. So we can, when we observe the corona, trying to measure its magnetic field, we also need to know what the boundary condition of the photosphere is, what the magnetic field is like in the photosphere. So this instrument is, again, it's a 15 centimeter uh, telescope. 
it's designed to have a 50 sluts and compact, very compact four disk spectral polarimeter to give us the boundary condition from the photosphere and chromosphere. And uh, the project is funded by uh, NSF uh, through a, a MRI project uh, funding. And uh, it's going to go on MIS uh, solar observatory in SPARS. And uh, the hope is that this instrument is designed to be small so we can put them in space in the future. And of course, this is thickest. And uh, the picture on the left is the DO NERSC uh, diffraction limited near infrared spectral polarimeter that I'm responsible for. Um, it's thickest is a very big telescope, and it's very hard to look at a very large area in a uh, field of view with a large telescope. Uh, so this the DO, DO NERSC uh, try to do that, and it, with a wide field mode it will have a 0 0.5 oxygen spatial sampling with, a, and it's unique in the sense that it's an integral field spectrograph. So we can look at the two dimension of um, field of view and obtain all the spectra within that field of view uh, simultaneously within one, one exposure. So it's going to be very useful for studying the dynamics of the, the, the sun uh, and, um, and it will cover three spectral lines simultaneously. So as you can see, all the trend is trying to go beyond the 10747 line and trying to, to uh, include the many more spectral line diagnostics that will give us more information and more constraint of our coronal uh, model or what, when, that we, when we are trying to derive the physical uh, property like magnetic field, uh, these new additional observation will give us uh, additional constraint. Of course, the uh, DKS has another instrument, cryoners, uh, that will cover uh, one to five micron, and it's a conventional one a single slit instrument. But its strength is that it will give us access to the thermal infrared spectral line that uh, we believe will be very powerful for coronal magnetic field measurements. Also, okay. so we are spending a lot of resources building all this instrument. And how do we utilize this data? And as, as Sarah showed you, for a model is a very powerful tool. And as solar astronomers, we all like to do inversion. And uh, can we take this data and actually, without model, recover what the magnetic field and the thermodynamic structure of the corona is like? So here is, so we, we take uh, and, and Sarah mentioned earlier that uh, the observation is all line of sight integrated because the corona is uh, uh, is optically thin, right? So the, the line of sight integration is always something nagging in the, in the back of our head. Can we really interpret the data, pretending that they all originate from the plane of the sky from a single source? So to answer that question, we took the MHD model from predictive science. They took the uh, the photo photospheric boundary condition, right, the MHD simulation, to try to model what the corona looks like, right? And these are the, our best corona model right now. So if we believe that this model tell us what the corona really is like, and they give you magnetic field temperature density uh, structure. So if you take that. And we understand how the spectral line is formed, how the polarization is uh, is influenced by magnetic field. Then we can calculate what the signal we should look at, we should see when we observe the corona. So there's two panels on the left, right? So the, this panel here, it shows the Stokes I, Q, U, and V uh, spectra of the 10747 line. And the red line shows that if we ignore the velocity of the corona plasma. The MHD model also includes the velocity field in the plasma. So if we ignore that, then the, the spectral line we will see is the red trace in the Stokes IQUV profile. The second uh, panel on the left is the, the first one on top shows the density, the black line shows density, the red line shows the temperature as a function of position along the line of sight, right? 
So if given a density and temperature and given the magnetic field at the bottom, the red line at the bottom panel is line of side magnetic field. And the uh, black line is the line of side velocity of the plasma. Then the, this panel here is the magnetic field angle, azimuth and longitudinal direction. So then you can calculate what the uh, immersivity of stops I, Q, U, and V is. Unfortunately, we didn't show V here. So if you look at the spectral line on the left, then they look pretty normal, right? Uh, like what we have seen uh, in those few observations we have. But if you look at the density which and temperature profile and the immersivity, well, you can almost say that yeah, the, the, the plane of the sky solution may be good enough. But if you look at the magnetic field, you find that the magnetic field varies within that the, the, uh, the contribution function. So can we derive a single magnetic field strength from a single spectrum, a single set of spectrum like this? I think that's questionable. And these two figures on the left shows another example that shows that the Stokes V, the black curve at the bottom, actually looks like our photosphere examined effect, uh, linear polarization profile. It doesn't have this, the anti-symmetric uh, profile like the red trace shows. It's because of the, uh, the, the large velocity field and the, with the combination of everything, density, temperature, velocity field, magnetic field, right? So far, we haven't seen any Stokes V spectra like this yet. But I think the purpose of this, two plot, this slide is to say that it's, we should be careful when we try to interpret our data, invert our data to derive a magnetic field, strength or orientation, uh, if we are trying to do inversion. Right? A single source inversion assumption may be applicable in some special cases, but in most of the cases, it's not, not a good assumption. So, and that give us to, take us to here that we, how do we solve this problem? And the problem, the, the, the solution really is just tomography, right? Tomography is that you try to observe your target from many different directions in an optically thin environment just like when we go to the hospital and they put us in the in the CT scan machine and, and after we, after a while they tell us what our heart look like, what our body, internal body, a structure of our body look like. So can we do tomography, put the, the sun in, in, in the CT machine? And that's what we are trying to do here, right? And it really is necessary Just because- Five more because, minutes. Okay. Five more oh, minutes. Okay. okay, five minutes. Anyway, so the, the it's it's necessary to do this in a space mission so we can look at the sun simultaneously in many directions because the dynamic time scale of the eruption is very very short, right? So so we have been working on this, trying to develop the vector tomography uh, inversion algorithm to reconstruct the three dimensional magnetic field structure of the corona, and most of the work is done by uh, Maxim Kramer here. And this is a simulation of what the observation of the sun looked like from different direction and different time in the CME. So since we don't have much time, I'll skip that. Tomography, I think most of you uh, would understand that it's looking at the optically thin um, line of sight integrated signal from many direction. If it's a linear problem, then you can almost solve it uh, analytically. And of course, if it's a uh, just intensity or uh, scale of in, inversion, then then uh, uh, this square, when you have uh, uh, redundant measurements, then we can do the tomography very easily. For magnetic field, it's a vector quantity we are trying to uh, reconstruct. So we actually, there's no mathematical proof that says there's a unique solution when we take all the observations and uh, trying to do the inversion. Um, so, our approach here is to take a model, a coronal magnetic field model from, uh, let's say, predictive science, and see if we can develop a algorithm and to recover the ground truth. That is the model. So there's a lot of uh, the, the, the math that we will skip, but here is a strategy. How do we do this? 
to measure, to, to synthesize the uh, spectral line we see, we need to know the temperature and density. And it turns out temperature and density can be, uh, the three-dimensional structure, temperature and density can be reconstructed also from tomography, from EUV observation or e, uh, of the coronal emission line or even visible in infrared. So we derive first the temperature and density structure from EUV observation. Then you take the polarization data uh, and then use tomography to reconstruct the vector magnetic field. And this is a uh, example of temperature and density reconstruction. And again, time is short, so we will skip that. This is the mathematics of trying to do the math, uh, tomography of a vector field, the magnetic field here in this case. And so we apply this, this method to, to the uh, comp data uh, back in 2015 and derived a three-dimensional structure of the coronal magnetic field of uh, one of the uh, Carrington rotation 2112. It's very crummy, and we have no way of proving this is, if this is correct or, or, or incorrect. Um, limitation. And so recently we have been engaged in trying to understand if quantitatively, if our reconstruction is correct. So this is again taking another MHD model, and this is a magnetic field temperature and density structure at two cross section. And trying to reconstruct the observed signal. So on the, on the left is the model Stokes Q map. On the, and the bottom is the Stokes U map. And the second column is what we reconstructed, right, from tomography. So we can reproduce the observed Stokes Q and U signal very well. But that doesn't guarantee that we have the right solution. That doesn't guarantee there's a, one unique solution. And the only way I can tell is to actually take the derived quantity magnetic field vector and compare it with your, your ground truth, the MHD model. So here, it's actually is a movie uh, that goes through the all uh, the 360 degree of the corona and but I'll skip the movies to show you that in one instance where this yellow box is, the left is the model, so that's a magnetic field strength. And it shows an, an active region poking out. And at the bottom is the, uh, the intensity, uh, synthesized coronal intensity map. The second column on the left shows us the, magnetic, the error in the magnetic field strength we have recovered. So it's basically uh, this quantity here, the tomographic reconstructed magnetic field strength minus the true field strength and divided by the uh, true field strength. So it, and so in this map, white in the magnetic field is good. It's very accurate. And at the bottom is the angle, the difference in the angle. When it's black, it's, it's good reconstruction. So what it's showing here is that we can reconstruct the polar region very well, and the active region also, but not in this streamer. Turns out this streamer has very weak magnetic field you know, in, in the MHD model. So it's a limitation that we haven't, we, we think maybe it's a digitization, a discretization error in the inversion program. We haven't really understand why, but this is another example and so here is the uh, scatter plot of the error again, fractional error against the magnetic field strength. So the top here shows that the RMS, the, the magnetic field measurement error or reconstruction error as a function of magnetic field strength actually is within 20%. And the angle uh, is a few degree for field strength between below five gauss. And for higher field strength, we actually have a larger uh, area in the angle about 15 degree. All right, so, I mean, in astronomy, this is pretty good. 20%, 15% error is in magnetic field strength. It's pretty good. So if we believe in the, in the accuracy of, of our algorithm, then we can take the 
comp data and start to measure directly the magnetic field free energy in the solar corona. And this is an example where we try to see if there's enough magnetic free energy before a CME, the map on the left is messy, let's ignore that, but the plot on the right shows that the solid curve is the magnetic free energy. If we integrate all the magnetic free energy within a cone, a light cone going up from the solar surface and in up to about 1.276 solar radii. And the horizontal line is the kinetic energy that was estimated uh, to be in that uh, CME event. And the dash line is the magnetic free energy from a, the MHD model of this current location. So it says that with an, a half cone angle of about eight degree, within that volume, there's enough magnetic free energy to power the CME already. Right, so our idea that magnetic free energy may be the uh, energy source of CME is still valid, right? But anyway, doesn't please finish in one or two minutes, please. Yeah, so that's my last slide. So, what was it again? What uh, I would like to um, demonstrate here is that the Corona spectroscopy and spectrophotometry actually can give us the three dimensional uh, structure of the solar corona, magnetic field, temperature, and density. Right? And this is just used on the linear polarization. Don't have time to talk about what if we include circular polarization, and this is only observation from a single planet uh, in the ecliptic plan. So there are room for improvement. And uh, so there are lots of work to be done. This is only the first step. and. Uh, um, but I think at the end, what I'm trying to get at is that if we can fly a mission to surround the sun with a lot of um, spectral polarimeter, then we can actually derive the three dimensional structure, magnetic field, temperature, and density of the corona. I think with good accuracy, that will help, help understand the physics of the solar eruption. So that's all I have to share with you today, and thank you. Thanks, Aoshin, for a great overview on the coronal spectropolarimetry using coronal emission lines. So let's take a couple of questions now. Yeah, Nagaraju, now you can ask your question. Nagraju? Asking kindly. You can unmute yourself. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you can hear me. Yeah, nice talk, uh, uh, So I, I forgot the name of the instrument, which is on uh, Miss Solar Observatory with 100 test leads. I just want to know what's the kind of uh, uh, integration time uh, needed for, you know, let's say, uh, magnetic field measurement of, let's say, 10 cars or so. Uh, for which instrument? Uh, which is uh, with the hundred uh, uh, slits. The hundred uh, slits. Yeah. yeah. So the the uh, I'm expecting the integration time to get linear polarization is very short. Within a, a few okay. tens of seconds, we can get very good signal. Huh. Circular polarization per slit position is going to be tens of uh, ten minutes ish to get to 10 to the minus four uh, polarization sensitivity. But if we have a hundred slits, the circular polarization measurements with this instrument, I don't think we can achieve uh, one minute's temporal resolution with good sensitivity. It's going to be 10 tens of minutes for circular polarization. But for linear polarization, we can get the dynamics at very high time, uh, high, high cadence. Okay, yeah, thanks. Any more questions? Okay, if not, thanks, Haoxing. So let's <laughs> move to the next talk of this session. Uh, let's now welcome Divya Oberoi from NCRA TAFR. He is presenting a talk on first radio evidence for ubiquitous magnetic reconnections and impulsive heating in the quiet solar corona. I'll be giving a warning uh, around 12 minutes.
Over to Divya Oberoi. Sure. Thank you so much. And I believe you can see my slides and you can hear me. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So thanks first to the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity to present some of our work, which we are really quite excited about. Uh, and this is also uh, welcome to one of the few radio talks. I think we have a few tomorrow morning and this is, I believe, the only one today. So I'm going to uh, talk about the first radio evidence for ubiquitous magnetic reconnections and impulsive heating in the quiet solar corona. And let me start by acknowledging my collaborators. So the pictures on the top are uh, of the uh, excellent students I've had the opportunity to work with. A part of what I'm presenting today is a part of thesis work of Shurajit Mondal, who recently defended his thesis. All the others are still working. We're still working together on this. We have also some partners from a company named ThoughtWorks and some colleagues from Curtin University in Perth. Okay. This audience really needs no introduction to the coronal heating problem. So maybe all I need to say is that uh, it's been many decades and we are still really trying to figure out how come the corona is able to maintain itself at a million degree Kelvin while it is sitting out atop a 5,700 Kelvin photosphere and a 10,000 Kelvin chromosphere, right? And we're hoping that what I'm presenting will form a part of the answer to this puzzle. Now, there have been various hypotheses put forward for explaining coronal heating. Uh, and another uh, one of the most promising ones, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, is the so called nano flare hypothesis, right? The idea basically being that all these convective foot point motions, uh, they jiggle the magnetic field around, they turn it into a sort of uh, complicated braided uh, geometry, a tangled magnetic field, which produces many opportunities for magnetic reconnection to take place, and thus provides a pathway for transporting this, the, uh, these energy from the convective motions to local heating to where these magnetic reconnections take place. Uh, this is a really promising hypothesis, and uh, this plot on the right, even though it's about 20 years old, is still a pretty good summary of where we stand on uh, our understanding observationally of these nanoflares. So it tells you that uh, we are able to get down to these nanoflare energies, about 10 to the power 24 ergs, but the slope of this power law sits robustly at about minus 1.8, uh, not quite the minus two or steeper, which is what you need for coronal heating. And also the distribution of most of these energetic events seems to follow that of the active region. So they're not really coming from the quiet sun, though now we have increasing evidence of uh, seeing some of these features coming from the quiet sun as well. So very good, but why why uh, look at this in radio? So the argument there is that all these reconnection events, however small they might be, they are going to give rise to non-thermal uh, electrons. And these suprathermal electrons sort of organize themselves into beams. And these beams of electrons on interaction with the thermal plasma through which they are propagating can give rise to plasma emission. Now, this plasma emission, uh, I use the word here, can produce a disproportionately large observational signature. And that, that is because this emission comes from a coherent emission mechanism, as opposed to the emission which we see at X-rays or uh, EUV, which comes from thermal emissions. Now, this has been appreciated for a while, but the reason why this has not really been done is because technically it's very challenging, right? You need to, uh, because we believe these... Uh, uh, reconnection events are going to be very impulsive. You need a uh, very high time resolution imaging. The signatures they would produce would be limited across a very small part of the band. So you need to be able to image over narrow bandwidths. And of course, we expect many of them to be taking place at any given time all over the quiet sun. So you need to be able to image with rather high imaging fidelity. The problem has been that such a capability had simply not been available till now. And only recently when uh, with the sort of new generation of instruments of which the Murchison Wide Field Array is an example, uh, they provide now a much denser Fourier coverage, which essentially leads to a, a much higher imaging quality. And it's one thing to have the ability in the data 
to do something and it's quite another to be able to extract that information from the data. And that is what is referred to here in, in the advances in the imaging algorithms. And that's something which we have been working on. And only comparatively recently, we have come to a stage where we have a robust imaging pipeline, which produces images of sufficient quality that we can actually address this problem. So that is what we, uh, we want to do, look for evidence for these uh, signatures of nano flares. So this is what we did uh, because it's useful to have a name to refer to these uh, guys too. Let's call them weak impulsive narrowband quiet sun emissions or winks. Okay. So here is what a typical image looks like. The blue circle is the sun. Uh, this is an active region which has been saturated to show the disk of the quiet sun, which you see is reasonably flat. Each of these small ovals represents the size of our point spread function or the resolution of our instrument. This particular image is, was made at 160 megahertz using half a second and 160 kilohertz worth of data. Let's define a, qu a quantity which we will call FIT, that for the ith tile in this image and for the tth timestamp, this represents the flux density coming from within this oval. Let's also define a quantity called FI, which is the median of this, this time series uh, coming for, from the region I. And the quantity we will look at essentially is the delta F by F uh, IT. And this is what the histograms of these uh, quantities look like, right? And you see, I mean, we were very excited to see that these histograms show a, a, a non-thermal tail, a high energy tail. That's certainly something which you don't expect from a thermal process. And when we tried to estimate their slopes, we found that they were sitting at, everybody was above two from about, uh, say, 2.16 to about 3.7. And to give you a sense for uh, the sensitivity of this work, I've uh, from delta F by F, I've given you an approximate uh, flux density units here, and we go down to something like one milli SFU, right? To put it in perspective, the last work which tried to do something like this, the weakest uh, uh, features which they were detecting were order one SFU, and we are about three orders of magnitude uh, deeper than those here. So for these uh, plots come from about 70 minutes of data uh, for which we analyzed only four of the spectral channels, but it still led to around 33,000 images. And we found in these gray areas where we have fit the power laws, there's a total of about 82,000 such features which have been detected, right? Looking at a few more details, if you look at the distribution of widths of these guys, it turns out that they, you have the largest number of uh, these events at exactly 0.5 seconds, seems to follow a power loss slope. This is also the resolution of our instrument. So most of them are actually unresolved in time. If you look at where they are happening on the sun, they seem to be happening all over the place. This uh, color bar here shows you the fraction of time for which these events were happening, right? So this was really exciting. They meet sort of all the requirements of uh, what you expect from uh, a coronal heating perspective. And so we wanted to verify this by looking at another piece of data. Right? And for that, we choose a data set where uh, which was even quieter than the one we had before. Here is an image of the same sort as you had earlier. And you will notice that this one has actually no active region. These data come from, I think, June of last year when the sun was exceptionally quiet. And when you construct, and by then actually we had also improved our imaging uh, quality a bit, and we also uh, improved our analysis a bit. And now if you look at the histogram uh, of the same sort as I had shown you earlier, this is what it looks like. Now, uh, we were very happy to see that we can see much larger number of such features and we still find them to be ubiquitous, but there was also some things we were puzzling about. If I compare it to the sort of histogram which we were seeing earlier and these green bars show the same extents, same spans on the x-axis, we find that this high energy tail is actually missing. And these should actually have been the easiest ones for us to find. So we were puzzling about that a bit. And after some effort, we realized that even though we'd been try quite careful about removing the contamination from the bright active region, which we had in the earlier data, it turns out that everybody who's sitting on this tail actually also lies in the image plane in the vicinity of that lone active region. Now we did not, uh, we don't have any more a power law to fit and uh, we, 
when we try to model this distribution, we find that this distribution is fit very well by a log normal distribution. And that immediately reminded us of the work which uh, had been done by Pollan and uh, Solanki, where they found that essentially, if you try to model the, uh, you construct, you synthesize a time series of uh, these impulsive events, uh, which is described by impulses of uh, lying between a minimum and a maximum strength described by a particular power law, a decay time, and some uh, occurrence probability. And when you model it, the observed time series, it is actually described very well by a log normal function. Uh, we're continuing to work on these now based on first principles because the reconnection events are expected to happen on very small spatial scales. You expect the intrinsic shapes of these wings to be very small as well. But we know that these are low radio frequencies. There's a lot of scattering in the corona, so they are going to get scatter broadened. Now, that's maybe an opportunity. Can we use these scatter broadened shapes? Can we resolve them? And if so, can we use them to say something about the in homogeneities which this, ra this radiation has encountered in the coronal medium. Now there's tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of these guys. So to be able to characterize them, you necessarily need some automated tools and we are working on developing some uh, AI ML driven techniques for doing that. And this is still a uh, work in progress, but we do find that uh, whenever we can identify isolated wings, they are indeed compact. Now, one shortcoming of these radio observations is, sorry? Two more minutes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one uh, shortcoming of these radio observations is because they arise, the, the, this radio emission is arising because of a nonlinear process. It is very difficult to go back to the amount of energy which would have been deposited in the corona. So uh, we were looking for sort of ways to see if we can do some estimates via the standard the DEM analysis, which is prevalent in the EUV X-ray wave bands. Almost sort of serendipitously, we, we found uh, a recurring wink in our, in our data, which seems to overlap uh, a somewhat prominent feature in uh, AIA. If you, the curve here at the bottom shows a radio time series, but which is smoothed over 15 seconds and all the dashed lines are what you see in various AIA filters. Now, given that our time resolution is half a second and most of these guys are very impulsive, there is no hope to look for a one-to-one -one correlation. But if we, uh, independent evidence, which I did not show here, also suggests that there is clustering at short time scales. So what we are trying to do is to see if one such cluster for which uh, we managed to identify uh, something happening in the AIA bands as well. Try to get some estimates for the energies uh, from AIA to see what's the ballpark they lie in. Okay. Uh, Near-term plans, like I said, we want to look at the spectral structure of these guys. What are their morphologies? Also wanted to look at their time profiles in the hope that maybe they'll give us some information about uh, the scattering tail if we can actually resolve it. Uh, to do that, we have also managed to get some high time resolution data, the same as what is used for pulsar observations with the MWA. Uh, like I said, we are trying to look for some correlations with EUV X-ray features and maybe get a handle on the energetic involves. Uh, later this year, we have the MWA phase three coming up, which will double the number of antennas we have. And we think that will also give rise to a significant improvement in our imaging quality, even beyond where we are. That would be very exciting. So that brings me to my summary. So uh, I hope I have convinced you that we have actually detected these weak, impulsive, narrowband quiet sun emissions from all over the quiet sun. They meet all the requirements for being relevant for coronal heating. Uh, I haven't given you any numbers, but they do allow us to probe energies which are much lower than what is typically possible with EUV or X-rays. There, there's still a lot which remains to be done for uh, a more detailed observational characterization of these guys, and especially when it comes to estimating the energy they correspond to, uh, the energy which has been deposited in the corona. But uh, I think we convinced that uh, they do form a part of the coronal heating budget and is not accessible by any other means. Uh, with that, I'll stop and take any questions. This session is now open for questions and comments. Please raise your hand. And Rakesh, please go ahead and mute yourself and ask the question. 
Yeah, uh, hello, uh, nice talk. So uh, I have actually two questions. Uh, so first is like, if you can go to third or fourth slide maybe. Uh, so why do you show the special distribution of these uh, wings? So yeah, so here there are some empty space in uh, like the uh, right center. Uh, so is there any uh, difference of their position or you claim it to be uniform? Ubiquitous, so I was just... Right, yeah. so oh, they, yeah. uh, those empty spaces correspond to the vicinity of this active region, which we had okay. not included in the analysis because we uh -huh. wanted to focus on the quiet sun part. Uh, okay, fine, understood. And uh, second question is, is there any, uh, till now, any uh, literature in that any simulation or forward modeling effort uh, to produce this kind of, uh, uh, which you uh, observe from the observation? Uh, not yet, but uh, okay. Shurujit Mondal, who recently finished his thesis, uh, right. as a part of his postdoctoral effort, that's exactly what he will be working on. Yeah, yeah. and uh, this work is already published. I mean, I was very curious if it is available what, to read on. Yeah. Correct. So what you have on the screen uh, was published last year. Uh, last year. Oh, I, I'll, right. I'll look for it in the... Sure, this is yeah. uh, AppJ Letters. You. I'll be happy to send uh, you the reference. Yeah. This yeah. Uh, is Please. yet to... Uh, Public, yet to be published. Okay, 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 thank you. Thanks. Very nice. Vishal, uh, uh, go ahead and mute yourself. Uh, thanks, Anna. Divya, this is a nice talk. Vishal here from Ayuta. Ah, uh, thanks, so, in, so uh, the delta F by F that you define, that doesn't have any units, right? So, how do you convert it to SFU? Huh, so, that's an independent. Uh, so. Uh, conversion. So the, you're absolutely right. Delta F by F is dimensionless. This is an independent uh, estimate which has been made by doing the flux calibration of these independent images. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you convert it to ERGs? I mean, is it possible? So, yeah, yeah. So an SFU is uh, 10 to the power minus 24 watts per meter square per hertz. Ah, okay. Okay. Thanks, Divya. Uh, there is I think I made a mistake, sorry. Not 10 to the power minus 24, 10 to the power minus 22. Yes, 22. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, Shashi, will you... Hello? Uh, hello, Divya? Uh, hello, Divya? It is... Please, please ask your question. Hello? Yes, hello? please ask your question. Yeah. Shashi, go ahead, please. Yeah. Very good. So, uh, the delta F by F, like... Uh, I'm wondering whether it is due to the intrinsic of the quiet sun or is it due to the radio wave propagation in the corona? So, uh, okay, so let, to make sure that I've understood your question, you're wondering if the delta F by F is arising just because of a propagation effect, correct? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Right, yeah. So uh, that's something which we have uh, also been wondering about, but I don't think it is actually arising anything uh, to do with propagation effect because we find that observational signatures of all of these guys to be very compact. Yeah. And when you look at it in the image plane, it is always uh, coming out to be a, a very compact thing. When we were trying to do it in, in our first attempt, we did not want to go to the limb of the sun where we would have, where you would expect larger propagation effects. And we wanted it to stay focused here. And uh, that was a part of the reason to avoid the complications because of the propagation effects. The other thing is that these guys are all very impulsive. So we had done uh, an order of magnitude estimate of how much change in the optical depth of the coronal medium do you need to see to be able to produce something like this? Okay. If you were to estimate it purely uh, based on a fluctuation of electron density in the corona, that seemed quite uh, unrealistic as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, let's move on. I see a few questions, but please ask uh, in the Slack channel. Uh, due to time limitation, we have to move on. So let's uh, thank Dibya and move Hello. on to the next one. Hello. Have you not? Uh, could you please ask the question in the Slack, chat, okay, Slack channel? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Divya, first of all, I would like to see you. Can you please turn on your video? Uh, my video is uh, on, Vinodhya. Uh, because thank you so much for sending me all the sending everyone all the messages. We have never met, but I am getting <laughs> messages from you every other day. So I wanted to thank you for that. And uh, I have a uh, couple of, uh, a bit this, yeah, a bit of couple of clarifications. Yeah, and uh, uh, see, so you mentioned the frequencies like 130 megahertz. 
and so on, do they correspond to the plasma frequency level on the solar atmosphere? That is correct, and they would lie at maybe between 1.2 and 1.5 solar radii from the center of yeah, the sun. Yeah, so they will be uh, out in the corona, and correct. there's a lot of non-thermal emission. Correct, uh, yeah. So this is like, is, can you separate the non-thermal and the thermal components? Yes, we believe the impulsive component can only arise because of the non-thermal uh, emissions, right? The thermal component will be slowly rising, slowly fading, and these also have a very narrow spectral structure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We have to, we have Thanks, to stop sir. here and move on. Uh, so the next talk is the invited uh, talk. It will be given by Hui Tian from Peking University. And here is the topic you already see in the screen. Please, Hui, go ahead. Hui? Hui, please go ahead and start your presentation. Okay, I, I just muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, so thank you, Tamoy, for the introduction. And also, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to this wonderful conference. And I'm Hui Tian from Peking University, and I'm going to talk about the prevalent transverse wave in the corona and the potential for mapping the corona magnetic field. Um, as, we, as we all know, routine measurements of the solar magnetic field have only been achieved at the photospheric level. So measurements of the magnetic field in the upper solar atmosphere, uh, especially the corona, are extremely difficult. In the past, only very limited measurements are available for the corona magnetic field. Uh, and these measurements are based on different techniques, and here at least some of them. And here I will focus on the technique of magnetoseismology, or somebody called corona seismology, and introduce the risk and development of this technique. So this method makes use of MHD oscillations or waves that are observed in coronal loops or other coronal structures. From the MHD wave theory, the observed wave parameters can be used to infer the average magnitude of magnetic field in the oscillating structures. However, these previously reported oscillations or waves are mostly transient events triggered by solar eruptions, often show a rapid damping and are just occasionally observed in small regions of the corona. In addition, the inferred magnetic field strength is usually a single number and often around 10 gauss. But obviously, their potential for corona magnetic field diagnostics is very limited. What we need are continuous diagnostics of corona magnetic field uh, in different parts of the corona structures, which could be achieved if we applied magneto seismology technique to more ubiquitous and continuous oscillations or waves in the corona. For example, sunspots are known to show pervasive magneto acoustic oscillations. And Jess and colleagues interpreted the, the corona propagating disturbances in sunspot regions as slow mode magneto acoustic waves. Combining AIA observation of these waves and magnetic field extrapolation, they derived the tube speed CT as a function of distance from the center of a sunspot. And from the DM analysis, they derived the electron temperature and thus the sound speed CS. Combining the sound speed and tube speed, they derived the alpha speed can be obtained. After estimating the density from the observed emission measure, they manage it to derive the magnetic field strength as a function of distance from their sunspot center. But in this talk, I will focus on transverse oscillations, at least two types of ubiquitous and continuous transverse oscillations are known to exist in the corona. Different from many transient oscillations triggered by solar options, these oscillations appear to be pervasive and do not show obvious damping. The first type are the so-called decayless oscillations, which normally refer to standing kink waves without obvious damping in kernel loops. These oscillations were first reported by Wang and myself in the year of 2012 through imaging and the spectroscopic observations respectively. The event reported by Wang et al. 2012 from AIA observations is actually triggered by a kernel mass ejection, and the oscillation lasts for more than 10 seconds and even reveals a growing amplitude. In the meantime, we performed a survey of Doppler shift oscillations using three months spectroscopic operations from the ICE spectrometer on board the Hinode spacecraft. 
we found that such decayed exhaustions are very common in quiet corner loops. They are often observed when their slit is aligned with the upper part of their kernel loops. And here I show one example. The slit is something in the, uh, the top part of some loops, and we see clear uh, Doppler shift oscillations throughout the entire observation period, which is more than three hours. These oscillations are most prominent in Doppler shift of emission lines with a formation temperature of 22 mega uh, Kelvin. And the velocity amplitude is normally one to two kilometers per second, so very low velocity amplitude. They generally reveal no obvious damping during the whole observation period, which often lasts for a few hours. Our analysis suggests that they are most likely kink oscillations. Different from the event reported by Wang et al. in 2012, our persistent oscillations are not related to any obvious solar eruptions. After the year of 2012, Oscillations with such characteristics were frequently reported from many other observations, and they were termed decayless oscillations. In the past few years, these decayless oscillations have been one focus of investigation in the MHD wave community. Now, how could these oscillations last for such a long time? Several models have been proposed to explain these oscillations. For instance, Antolin et al. found that their Kevin Hemmerholtz uh, instability vortices uh, from the impulsively excited kink oscillations can extend the apparent decay time of the kink oscillations, which may explain the decayless behavior of these waves. There are also suggestions that these decayless oscillations are self oscillations, um, normally triggered by loop flow interactions. And Nakareyakov and colleagues have developed models uh, in this category. These oscillations have also been modeled as standing kink waves driven by footpoint drivers, and the footpoint driver can be monoperiodic or broadband. For instance, um, Alpha Nassif and colleagues developed a 1D dimensional, 1D time dependent uh, analytic model by considering the kink oscillations of kernel loops driven by continuous random motions of loop footpoints, and they have managed it to reproduce a number of observational results. So similar to the decaying kink oscillations, the periods of these decayless oscillations have also been found to be related to the loop length and kink speed. So uh, basically, we can use the same set of equations to derive the orphan speed and magnetic field strength. Compared to the occasionally observed decaying kink oscillations, the ubiquitous presence of these decayless oscillations now allows a regular application of the magnetic technology. So here I show one example where the orphan speeds are derived from the analysis of the decayless oscillations in different kernel loops. Okay, so this is the first type of these persistent oscillations. The second type of ubiquitous, ubiquitous and continuous transverse oscillations in the corona were discovered with the corona multi-channel polarimeter or the COMP instrument. Um, before presenting our result, let me first briefly explain how COMP observes the corona. COMP is a chronograph with a 20 centimeter aperture managed by HOO's Mount Lower Solar Observatory in Hawaii. Using the iron 13 1074 nanometer and 1079 nanometer infrared spectral lines, it can observe the solar corona in the range of about 1.05 to 1.35 solar radii from the solar center through imaging spectroscopy and also spectral polarimetry. Basically, COMP takes images of each polarization state at, each, at several wavelengths positions across a spectral line profile. For instance, at these three, uh, at three different times, COMP takes images of the corona at these three different wavelength positions across the iron 13 1074 nanometer spectral line profile. So at each spatial pixel within the field of view, such as this one, we can construct uh, spectral profile, although the profile only consists of three data points. By fitting the observed line profile with the Gaussian function, we can obtain the line intensity Doppler shift at each pixel. Then we can produce maps of the line intensity and Doppler shift for the whole field of view. Comp observations have revealed a uh, um, pervasive propagating transverse wave in the corona, which were first reported by Steve Tanchek and colleagues in the year 2007. What I show here is a movie of the Doppler shape of the iron 13 1074 nanometer line above the solar limb, and we can see ubiquitous propagating disturbances. 
Since the Doppler shift refers to the motion around the line of sight and the magnetic field lines in the offing corona are largely perpendicular to the line of sight, these disturbances are essentially signatures of transverse MHD waves. So propagation speed is generally a few hundred kilometers per second. These waves are most likely king waves, or some people call them orphanic waves. The discovery of these waves opens a new window for coronal plasma and magnetic field diagnostics. Using COMP observations, we recently mapped the global current magnetic field for the first time. This movie shows a Doppler shift image sequence obtained from our COMP observations in the year of 2016. And we clearly see the pervasive Doppler shift fluctuations almost everywhere in the field of view. In other words, our observation reveals, ubiqu reveals the ubiquitous presence of the propagating kink waves in the global current. And we applied a wave tracking technique to the whole field of view and obtained the global distribution of the wave propagation direction or angle for the first time. Because the kink waves propagate along their magnetic field lines, the wave propagation angle is essentially their plane of sky orientation of the current magnetic field. So through so this way, we have measured the plane of sky direction of the magnetic field in the global corona. The wave, the wave tracking technique also allows us to calculate the wave propagation speed. This was achieved through the following procedure. So for each spatial pixel, we first determine a wave propagation track with the length of 31 pixels based on the map of the wave propagation angle I just presented in the uh, last slide. We then construct a space-time diagram of the Doppler velocity around this track. A 2D FFT is then applied to this space-time diagram resulting in a K-omega diagram. Uh, after that, we perform a inverse FFT for the negative frequency part of the K-omega diagram, which leads to the space diagram of the outward propagating waves. An example of this space-time diagram is shown here. From this space-time diagram, we cross-correlate the time series at the center of the track with those at other pixels along the track. Then we obtain the time lag corresponding to their maximum correlation coefficient. Finally, we fit a linear model to the relative position along the track as a function of time lag. The slope is taken as a wave phase speed. We uh, repeated the same procedure for all spatial pixels within the field of view and obtained a global map of the wave phase speed, which is shown on the left here. We, we can see that the phase speed mostly lies in the range of 300 to 700 kilometers per second. The uncertainty shown on the right is dominant, dominant by the uncertainty in the fitting parameters, which is generally smaller than 40 kilometers per second. Comp also observed another area of uncertainty line, the 1079 line. And the intensity ratio of the 1074 and 1079 nanometer line is actually sensitive to the electron density. So we can use these two lines to uh, pro the electron density in the current. We used the KNT database to generate the theoretical relationships between the line ratios and electron density at different heights in the corona. Both correlational excitation and photic excitation were considered in the patient. The figure shows the theoretical curves for different heights. And here the panel B and C shows the intensity images of the two iron certain lines, and panel D is the intensity ratio of the two lines. From the theoretical relationship between the line ratio and the electron density at different heights, we can obtain the global distribution of the electron density, which is shown in panel E. And panel F here shows the uncertainty of the density measurements. Based on the results from wave tracking and density diagnostics, now we can map the coronal magnetic field. The phase speed is essentially the kink speed which is related to the magnetic field strength and plasma density inside and outside of flux tubes. In this equation, the subscript I and O represent the parameters inside and outside flux tubes, respectively. In the low beta corona, in the low beta corona environment, pressure balance, as we know, is dominated by the magnetic pressure. So the local uh, field strength inside and outside flux tubes are basically the same. But due to the moderate spatial resolution of COMP, uh, we cannot resolve individual narrow flux tubes. So the derived density is sort of an average of the densities inside and outside the flux tubes. Considering this, the first equation here reduces to the second one. 
the measured phase speed should be the kink speed propagated, uh, should be the kink, kink speed projected onto the planar sky. And we further approximate the average density in the vicinity of the planar sky with the derived density. This is a, actually a reasonable approximation because our measurements are based on the spectral line profiles that result from an integration of the spectral line emissivity. Since the uh, emissivity increases with density and the density generally decreases with distance from the solar link, the line of sight weighting actually favors magnetic, magnetic structures in the vicinity of the planar sky. And actually forward simulation of the propagating kink waves um, uh, performed by the Belgian group have also demonstrated that this is an appropriate approximation. By substituting the derived phase speed and density to this equation, we can easily calculate the plane of sky component of the magnetic field strength in the current. And we can see that uh, here, uh, this is a global distribution of the magnetic field. And we see the typical value of the magnetic field in the field of view of uh, one to four Gauss. And the uncertainties were calculated by propagating the uncertainties in the measured density and phase speed, and they're generally smaller than 15%. Our results have been summarized in two papers and recently published in the journals of science and science channel technological sciences. Although our technique is very promising for routine measurements of the current magnetic field, it does have several limitations. For instance, uh, we can only measure the plane of sky component in the off-link corona. And also in the uh, low emission corona hole region, the signal to noise is too low to allow uh, reliable measurements. And our technique also requires a continuous observation of one to two hours under good observing conditions, uh, which includes one hour to observe the transverse waves and additional time for density diagnostics. So to produce one corona magnetogram, we need at least one to two hours. And also our technique cannot be applied to regions affected by solar eruptions where the signatures of the transverse waves are masked by the rapidly changing magnetic field environment. So what are the solutions? So in the future, we need to build a more advanced chronograph such as the Cosmo chronograph uh, um, proposed by, by HO. And we need to, uh, and this chronograph actually has a large aperture, so the signature noise will definitely be higher. And also it will observe larger regions in the corona. So we can track these waves to a larger distance and diagnose the magnetic field in larger uh, regions in the corona. And at the same time, I think, with that, I think that we should also keep an open mind to try to explore uh, different methods of corona magnetic field measurements because each method or each technique of corona magnetic field diagnostic has its own limitations. So we need to, if we put the information obtained from different techniques together, we certainly will have a better understanding of the corona magnetic field. Okay, so um, that's what I want to see. Here is a summary. Um, observations of the prevalent decay list kink oscillations and the ubiquitous propagating kink waves allow regular diagnostics of the current magnetic field through magnetoseismology. And using comp observations of the propagating kink waves, we have mapped the plasma density and kink speed in the global corona. Combining these, we have measured the global corona magnetic field for the first time. And these results demonstrate the capability of imaging spectroscopy in current magnetic field diagnostics. And with this technique, current magnetic field maps could in principle be routinely obtained. And um, that's all I want to say. So thank you for your attention. Well, thanks, Hui, for shedding light on the potential of transfer phase uh, for understanding coronal magnetic fields. Uh, let's take questions now. We have one raised hand from Arno Brachodori. Uh, yes. Uh, so you talked about this uh, DKLS oscillations. And we have all have uh, seen movies of uh, is, uh, loop oscillations induced by some explosion, which would typically decay away after uh, four or five cycles, whereas these are decayless oscillations. So I think at decayless oscillations, uh, you told uh, mentioned a little bit about the different groups have given different theories, but you did not get into the details. Of course, the decayless oscillations can be produced in two ways. 
uh, that if the damping is very low or in spite of the damping, if there is some, some, some source which is uh, feeding, keeps feeding energy into the system. So what is happening presumably is uh, this fact that the loop oscillations die after four or five oscillations implies that, uh, that, that, uh, that the damping is quite high. So what is happening here? What is the physics? Some energy is continuously being pumped. Would you like to yeah. comment on this? Yeah, this is a very good question. Thank you, Arnav. Um, actually, um, I, I think that um, the, the decayless behavior of these oscillations simply suggests that there is a continuous supply of the energy to the system. So if there's only one pulse, right, then we can um, quickly see the damping. Uh, if we have continuous uh, pulsations or continuous drivers, then before the damping of the first uh, uh, oscillation, the second oscillation are already started. And then in that case, we can have a superposition of different um, pulses or different uh, single oscillations. Uh, and this superposition leads to the decayless behavior of these oscillations. But of course, this continuous energy supply, uh, uh, different people for this continuous energy supply, different authors or different colleagues have different um, ideas. I mean, they have, for instance, here, at least some of these ideas. Um, I personally I personally didn't do too much work on the generation mechanism of these decayless oscillations, um, but um, I would suggest uh, those who are interested in this uh, to take a look at these uh, publications. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Krishna, you can ask your question. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, hi, Hui. Uh, so uh, my question is the ubiquitous uh, nature of these oscillations is uh, good to measure uh, magnetic field across uh, uh, such a uh, vast spatial region. But it is also a problem in the sense that uh, because you have line of sight integration, so there are, uh, especially off limb, there are several overlapping structures. So can you comment on that? Yeah, of course. I mean, um, the line of sight integration is actually um, the common problem for or optically seen, essentially or optically seen observations, right? If you look at the AIA images, you you, you still have, you also have this line of sight integration problem, uh, or I wouldn't call it problem, I just call it line of sight integration effect, right? But still, by analyzing the AIA data, you learn a lot, right? Um, uh, I think this, uh, the, uh, the, the drive, because our measurements are based on the spectral profile that result from integration of the spectral line, emissivity around the lamp side to wrap density, phase speed, and magnetic field strength or, or, or uh, weight by the emissivity around the lamp side. And if you consider the effect that density generally decreases with distance, it decreases quickly with distance from the solar line. The line of sight weighting factor, the, the line of sight weighting basically favors and they structure in the vicinity of the plane of sky. So basically what we measure is the plane of sky component of the magnetic field in their dominant emission structures in their line of sight direction. I didn't say their magnetic field will mirror is their, plan, is their magnetic field in their plane of sky. It's actually the plane of sight component of their magnetic field in their dominant emitting structures in their line of sight direction. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and another way to uh, sort of for, uh, minimize the effect of the line of sight integration is to combine and like forward modeling uh, or analysis. And actually several groups in the world have already uh, done a lot of work in this direction. So if you combine, if you combine these operations and this forward modeling, we certainly can have a better understanding uh, of the mirrored magnet field. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Dish, go ahead. Hi, Hui. Uh, I have a basic question regarding that FFT part. So you suppressed the downward moving waves. So any specific reason for choosing only the uh, outward propagating part? Uh, yeah, so the fact is that the downward propagating waves usually have a lower power as compared to the uh, upward propagating waves. Uh, so that's why we uh, didn't use the downward propagating part. Um, but actually, if you compare, um, their, their, their speed, the propagating speed or their phase speed of this downward propagating and uh, upward propagating wave, you can see that they are more or less 
the same. So it's a pretty similar. Okay. So yeah. uh, do you have any movie of this separated only just the outward uh, uh, part kind of thing? Uh, movie of <coughs> yeah, because the, in FFT, I uh, remember it requires high spatial and temporal resolution. So uh, how well these are like separated? These powers are uh, getting separated. Uh, you mean they're they're obviously propagating waves. How how reliable we separate these? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I don't have a plot here, but uh, um. I mean, people from HAO and also from UK and from our group have done a lot of work in the past several years. And we, we, we have a lot of discussion about this uh, technique. So um, and I can say that we are pretty confident on the separating of these two components. Okay. So Actually, if you, if you just, um, I mean, if you don't separate the two components, if you just use the original space-time diagrams, you, you the airplane uh, phase speed that is not that different from there's phase speed derived from only the upper propagating waves. So there, are, at least their magnitude should be no problem. Okay. Okay. Mm. Okay. Uh, last we, we actually have a detailed description of detailed description of this technique and some potential problems uh, in 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 the in the paper of this one and the second paper we have. Uh, uh, some detailed description of, their, of this technique and, and mention some potential problems in this paper. So if I'm interested, you're encouraged to read this paper. Yeah, sure. I will uh, go through it and uh, get in touch to you. Mm, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Deependu, uh, last question of this session. Yeah, so this is an open question for we or Haosheng or Sarah, whoever wants to take it. Uh, so from the perspective of, of uh, utilizing full MHD dynamical models, to predict the solar coronal magnetic fields and uh, the polarization characteristics. Uh, one of the challenges is we often have to use various simplifying assumptions for, for the background density stratification and temperature of the corona. Uh, and the thermodynamics that we get self consistently from the models may not be something that is a reasonable match to the, to the huge stratification that you see uh, and the temperature structure in the, in the transition region. So given this background, um, question that I have for you is how sensitive is the forward modeled correlation characteristics uh, to the thermodynamic properties of the corona? If you can comment on that, uh, that'd be useful. Well, um, I, uh, here, what I show here is our basically uh, observations. Uh, we actually didn't uh, use any models in this right. any, any MHD models in in the in our in the work I show here, um, but I think what you what you said it's it's actually correct. I mean, if you take a, an MHD model and do this for calculation, certainly there are a lot of uh, assumptions in the model, but they're saying that we are. Um, I think we are we're not we're, we're I think these these are something the model. Um, to some extent, doesn't matter too much because we want to. What we want to verify is to um, either what to say. I mean, from the model, you calculate uh, the the polarization of like the uh, around thirteen ten seventy four nine lines, right? And then you you sort of will compare uh, this um, modeling result with uh, the observed uh, spectra, observed uh, stock parameters, and try to interpreted interpreted the observers the observer stock parameters um, in the framework of their of their form modeling um yeah I, I really cannot say too much about um uh, how the assumption in the models can affect the interpretation but maybe maybe Sarah can uh, comment on this question yeah I can comment briefly um it is something we've looked at the um the linear, the, the circular polarization, um, when you're looking at the fraction of, of V over I, uh, you, um, you're canceling out largely the density uh, sensitivity because this, the V and the I are both sensitive to density in the same linearly. However, it's the difference of the integral uh, of a ratio and the ratio of an integral. So there are some effects that can be in some weighting. There's a stronger effect that comes into the linear polarization fraction 
and the forward modeling of that in the density. So this is something we've looked at in various papers and um, uh, in, in, in both G's and Marcel's papers, they, they do look at that. And Marcel is working on another analysis um, doing uh, forward modeling of the, this, this non-potentiality index. And he's looking at in a global simulation in this case, not just like a flux row. And um, there are in fact some, um, even in the circular polarization non-potentiality sensitivities to the, the assumptions of plasma distribution. We do things like, for example, use an MHT simulation as our ground truth, but then replace it with a hydrostatic fall off or um, we have various assumptions we've tested and in order to probe this sensitivity. So um, yeah, it's something that needs to be considered. Uh, but I, I think what Hao Sheng did with Maxim Kramer, where they actually try to get the plasma distribution along the line of sight using other observations is a really nice way to, to okay. approach yeah. the problem. Mm -hmm. So what, what about the, the effect on the temperature, Sarah? On the temperature, well, um, so the temperature effect, I'm, I mean, the density is what's really weighting the, the plasma, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, but the temperature, temperature determines the availability of a certain spectral line. Right. To some extent. Right. We, we think we should stop here, you know, we're already running uh, pretty late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I would, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, chairs for conducting the session. We had a very interesting discussion. I think we are running late, about 15 minutes late. So probably we should shift the next session by 15 minutes too. So instead of 11.30 IST, we will for uh, we will start at 11.45 IST, just 15 minutes shifted the next program, next session. So I hope the next session chairs take note of that. So we will, we will come back at uh, 11.45, just five minutes before that. Probably. Sir, Raj Guru, so if the next session speakers are here, I would request them to be online maybe 10 minutes from now so you can test out the you know, system. No, fine, fine. You, you, can, you can coordinate that. So, so the Zoom meeting will be on. So uh, we will take a break. Okay. We will come back. at The session starts at 11.45 IST, next one. All right. All right. Okay, thank you. So let's spend okay. 10 minutes uh, with other speakers so that we can start coordinating the talks. Thank you. So Dibyendu, the next chair, uh, so you uh, hope you noted the shift, so everything will get shifted. You yeah, I know, but I wanted people to anyway come in so that I want to make sure this next session is going to be tight. We, you know, it's going to eat into the lunch time. So I want to make sure that these people test out their talks and everything is like smooth. Um, yeah, so, yeah. That's, so that's fine. So the, the afternoon sessions too get shifted by 15 minutes. So I will, we will make an announcement at the end of the next session. So is it correct that we start at 11.45? Correct, correct. Okay, fine. Thanks, Rajguru. Thank you. Yeah, I think Aungshu is also having some problems connecting in, so she's trying to use her tab or something. So hopefully she'll be able to get in time. Okay, Dibindu, hi, Ramit. Yeah. Hey, Ramit, do you want to test out your stuff now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so why don't you do something? Why don't you try using your shared screen and yeah. just get ahead of it with it? Let's try that. So can you see the slides? Yep, I can see your slide. Can you make it full screen and try to shift them? Do you have any movies? Yeah, no. Okay, play the movie. Yep, great. Looks good. <laughs> Yep, looks good. So now you can stop sharing. Yeah, just let me check whether my video is working or not. Wait a second.
Lamit, your your audio could be a bit of an issue. Um, let yeah, me see. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Now is it okay? Yeah, now it is fine. So make sure that you're close to the mic when you are speaking. Yeah, exactly. And you can see me, right? I can see you. Yeah, exactly. I can see you. Right. And you're looking good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So Welcome. <laughs> Let's Thanks. have a party. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Not right now. I see Naveen. Um, uh, yeah. So let Naveen, do you want to test your sharing. test out your slide quickly? Yeah, sure. Let me see. So Ramit has to put his slide off first, and then. Yeah, I did that. Okay. Um, uh, I see Aushu. Yeah, hi. Good to see you, and glad that you could figure out the problems. It's I'm fine. using another computer. I couldn't figure out. Okay, but it's okay. We are we are hearing you loud and clear. We can see you, so you are you're looking good. So it's, it's good. You're all set. Naveen, you want to? Yeah, I see your slide, Naveen. And things are changing. Can you speak, Naveen, so that I can just make sure your audio is fine? Naveen, can you speak? Hello, is this working? Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Thank you very much. I think you are good to go. Um, let's see. Um, Mike, are you around? Mike Whitland? No, no. Mike, yes, no, yes, I am. No. Hello. Mike, do you no, want to test on. out your talk? Yeah, I can I'll try and share my screen. Sounds second. good. Good to see you, Mike. Yeah, good to see you, Dipiendu. Um, It's Australia, right? So it must be late evening or something like that. Uh, it's 5 p.m. 5 p.m., all right. Approaching 5. Evening, Mike. Yeah. Uh, just a quick, uh, quick announcement, Mike. If you just joined, we got delayed. Uh, the previous session, so the next session starts 15 minutes later than what originally planned. Okay, no problem. 5.15. So is my screen sharing, it's working all right? Yes, Mike, it's working all right. Um, can you maybe move for, move forward the slides? and uh, yeah. yep. yep. Great, perfect. Do you have any movies you want to test out? Uh, no, there's no movies there. All right, great. Okay. I see, okay. Right. Perfect. You're good to go, Mike. Okay, cool. Okay, who else? Uh, let's see. So, um, Abhash, Abhash, Abhash Asgarov. Abhash, are you here? Abhash? Okay, I don't think Abhash is here. Bagesh, are you here? Hello. Yes, August. We can hear you. Uh, there seems to be some feedback from your end. If you have two devices open, maybe you should switch off one. Okay. Yeah, testing it. Okay, let me then try. Or I don't know. Maybe yeah. I don't know whether it's because many of us have our mics open. Whether that's the reason. Uh, So when you are ready, you can you can put your slides on so that we we know you know when that things are working for you. So now, uh, yeah, I see your screen. Okay, so let me speak on the presentation. Is this? Uh, yes. Can you make it full screen, please? Perfect. Now you can try moving forward. All right. Yes, your movies are working too. Everything looks good. Perfect. Excellent. I don't see you. Your video is off. Uh, I don't know whether you want to put your video on, but if you want to put your video on, you might want to test it out once. If not, it's okay. Yep, Vagesh. I, we see you now. Great. All right. Stop okay, so I mean, there is one issue. I don't know whether others are, others are feeling it, but I feel some feedback. I think you are using two devices, one to 
present and want to use the audio or something like that. Is that correct? That is it. All right. Okay. So by mistake, Vagish was here in this room and he opened his laptop too. So he. Ah, is... Yeah. All right. I think he needs to be in a different room because otherwise there's going to be strong feedback. Okay. 2021. Okay. So I think, I think we are all set. Um, here is a discussion I want to do. I, I sent an email to Rajguru yesterday about the conduct of this session. I don't know whether he forwarded it to the speakers. But so we have one invited one invited talk by Mike, and then the rest are, are solicited or contributed talks. So the invited talk is a 30-minute talk. Um, Mike, uh, what I was thinking is to leave aside three minutes for questions, if we, if we can manage that, uh, and therefore give you a warning at at something like 22 minutes. Like give you a five minute warning at 22 minutes. Is that fine with you? Or would you like a warning at 25 minutes? No, 22 is fine. That's good. Okay, great. Thank you, Mike. Um, for the other speakers, so you have 15 minutes uh, for your talk. Uh, so let's suppose that we keep aside two minutes for questions. Um, then is it okay if I give you a warning, a three minute warning at, uh, 10, at 10 minutes into your talk? Is that fine? Even though I think uh, five minute warning would be good. Five minute warning, then you would get that at eight minutes. Um, is that is that final? Oh, you want to you want to uh, you want to put hold two minutes for discussion, right? That's right. I mean, see, uh, I mean, it's a soft warning. I mean, if you don't finish within you know within that okay, time, you can okay, you can okay. take your whole fifteen minutes or your whole thirty minutes, but then you know we probably will not be taking many questions. Maybe just at most one question. So it's a kind of a you know. I mean, uh, a balance has to be struck uh, between the length of your talk and the amount of time we yeah. can have for this. So that's something that's up to you in the sense that, uh, I mean, if, you know, I'm not going to force stop you at 30 minutes, right? I mean, I'm going to let you go until 15 minutes. So Yeah, it's okay with me. Okay, great. All right. So I'll give you a three-minute warning at 10 minutes. And uh, so Anshu is going to be introducing you and and inviting you to give your talk. Uh, Anshu, are we around? She is the co-chair. Um, she was having some issues earlier, but she managed to sign in. Yeah, Anshu, are you there? Yeah. All right, great. So you have the have the speaker list in front of you, I suppose. So yeah. I will just briefly introduce you and then hand hand over the session to you. And I will do the dirty work of, of keeping time and, and uh, warning the speakers uh, so that you can you can just get along with, with conducting the session. Okay. Okay. And I can go ahead and conduct the question and answer session. I mean, sure. All right. Great. So we are all set. And I guess we are going to meet at um, 11.45, which means 15 minutes from now. So you have 15 minutes break. All right, so I will just, uh, you know, switch off my mic and, and video and then just uh, be back in 10 minutes. So that's fine.
So folks, welcome back. This is uh, Dipyandu. We, we, we will start the session in a minute. Amushu, are you here? Yeah. All right, it's 11.45, so let's uh, let's begin our session two on coronal magnetism. Um, so I am Dibyendu Nandi from Aizar, Kolkata. I am the co-chair of this session, along with uh, Aungshu Singh. Uh, so Aungshu, let me introduce Aungshu. Aungshu Singh uh, did a PhD sometime back uh, on um, uh, solar instrumentation, building uh, spectroparameter instruments for radio astronomy and is right now working in the University of Helsinki uh, for diagnosing cordial magnetic fields uh, utilizing radio observations. So Aungshu will lead you through the session. So Aungshu, over to you. You can introduce the speakers and get along with the session. Aungshu. Yeah, thanks, Devendu. Uh, our first talk is in this session is an invited talk. So this first speaker is Dr. Michael Wheatland from University of Sydney. He will be talking about coronal magnetic field extrapolation. So, Dr. Wheatland, you can take the floor. Thank you, Anshu. Um, so, uh, hello to everyone. Um, I am Mike Wheatland, as mentioned. I'm at the University of Sydney, and I'm talking about coronal magnetic field extrapolation. So, thank you to the organizers also for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, so coronal magnetic field extrapolations is my topic. Here's a really beautiful example that I'll talk about uh, in, uh, a little bit later on. So uh, first of all, some, some background or motivation. Um, the, <clears throat> the reason for the modelling, the extrapolation, is that sunspot magnetic fields, of course, power solar flares and coronal mass ejections, large-scale solar activity. And uh, these events drive uh, space weather events in our vicinity. So that gives a motivation for wanting to uh, better understand and model the source regions of the sun, the uh, strong magnetic fields in and around sunspots. Now, the coronal magnetic field is uh, not amenable to direct measurement or it's difficult to measure, although Sarah Gibson, of course, was talking about that a little earlier on. Um, uh, the most detailed information we have about, about coronal magnetic fields uh, is provided really by measurements or determinations of the magnetic field in the low atmosphere. So spectropolarimetric determinations of uh, photospheric magnetic fields provided by vector magnetograms, which give the full vector field uh, at, in the low atmosphere. And you can treat uh, those uh, magnetic field values as boundary uh, values for then for a uh, reconstruction problem. You can solve a model subject to the boundary conditions. So that's extrapolation or reconstruction. Now, the nonlinear force-free model is, uh, is, is often chosen. Um, in part, one motivation is that the, uh, the actual coronal field may be approximately force-free. But of course, there's a hierarchy of models that you could use. And if you want to use a dynamic model, then magnetohydrodynamics is the standard. In that case, you've got uh, four dependent variables, um, and it's a time-dependent model, a dynamic model. So you're really solving an initial value, boundary value problem if you're using the, the boundary conditions of the sun to, to, um, to solve the model. Uh, and that, that approach is in the solar context is called data-driven modeling, and it's a really rapidly developing field and really interesting, but I'm not going to talk about it here. Um, a simpler model that is a static model is the magnetohydrostatic model. Uh, in that case, you include uh, magnetic forces and pressure and gravity. And I will talk about this brief, briefly. Uh, it's static, so you, you're then solving a boundary value problem. And various approaches have been proposed for the, the solar scenario. Um, and the model I mentioned already, the nonlinear force-free model, is the simplest of the ones that I've listed here. Uh, in that case, you consider only uh, magnetic forces and you've got a boundary value problem for your single dependent variable, the magnetic field. So that approach is routinely used for numerical extrapolation. There are other, are other approaches and I'll say something about those in this talk. Now, the nonlinear force-free model has become uh, fairly standard and uh, it enables all sorts of study of magnetic fields in the sun's corona. 
Uh, this is a slide I've shown a few times in talks, which uh, illustrates um, nonlinear non -linear force free modeling applied to uh, photospheric mag um, boundary values and shows um, you know, the sorts of things that you can do. You can, you can identify structures that are, that are there. You can work out the topology of the structures and do all sorts of other things. Um, so this is really uh, the, the nonlinear force free um, extrapolation has enabled all sorts of studies of, of coronal magnetic fields. The model itself I'll speak briefly about. So um, uh, the model consists of the assumption that there's only a magnetic force and so the Lorentz force, so it, it, in equilibrium it must be zero. Um, that is the, uh, the electric current density must be parallel, everywhere parallel to the magnetic field. And then you've got a magnetic field so the divergence of B must be zero as well. Um, J, the current density is parallel to the magnetic field. That tells you that there's um, that the, the two vectors are in a ratio at a point in space. Um, that ratio gives you the force-free parameter alpha. So you can reformulate the equations in terms of the force-free parameter alpha. That, that's given as equations two there. Um, and it's easy to see that uh, the force-free parameter is a constant along magnetic field lines. Now, uh, equations one or two, these equivalent statements of the force-free model, they, they represent non-linear equations. You can see that simply with the first equation in that the J is the curl of B. So B appears twice in that first equation, J cross B equals zero. So they're non-linear and they're difficult to solve in general. Um, and the approaches that are used are iterative. Um, so uh, a number of approaches are listed there, the Grad-Rubin iteration approach, and then optimization and the magnetofrictional method. Uh, the second and third approaches are probably the most popular uh, methods. Now the boundary conditions on the model are interesting. If we consider the solution a half space um, where, uh, Z, um, where the Z equals zero plane represents our photosphere and we're, we're doing local Cartesian modeling, ignoring the curvature of the sun, then the boundary conditions on the uh, model in a half space are the normal component of the field in the boundary, BZ and Z equals zero. And then the values of the force-free parameter alpha over one polarity of the field, over one sign of BZ, and I'll label the two polarities P and N. You only need to specify alpha over one polarity because alpha is a constant along field lines. So some solution methods specify the full vector field B in the boundary. That's an overprescription and it can lead to problems. The vector magnetograms provide values of um, BZ needed by the model, and you can also construct values of alpha using uh, finite differencing on your um, transverse field values. That's equation three. And so thereby you can get values of alpha over both polarities of BZ. And so that's an overprescription of the uh, boundary values uh, of alpha. Uh, and in general, the magnetogram data are inconsistent with the force-free model. So the values of alpha that you obtain in that way are, are inconsistent. The values on the positive polarity are not um, consistent with the ones on the negative polarity given the model. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, that inconsistency will lead to problems. Uh, now, the origins of the inconsistency, there are certainly uh, errors in the measurements in, in the inference of the field uh, and the inferred values of alpha. Um, but importantly, also, the, the photosphere is, is not force free. Um, so there are non-magnetic forces at the level of uh, which the magnetic field values are determined. Um, the effect on the solutions. I have listed three problems here that I'll call P1, P2 and P3. So P1, the um, this inconsistency will lead to, to inaccuracy in your solutions to the model, departures from the force-free condition or the divergence-free condition of the field. The second problem, P2, is that the, um, the results produced by your code may not, uh, with a particular code using a particular method, may not agree with results using another method. Uh, and then also P3, you can get different results even when using the same method. That's interesting. Um, so I'll just go through these briefly. So P1, the inaccurate results. Um, uh, an example is that the optimization method may produce results where the divergence of B is significantly, significantly non-zero. Now, uh, uh, there is a, a standard uh, method for treating the boundary conditions, pre-processing, which is, which is intended to address this problem, but I, it, it doesn't exactly fix the problem. That's clear. Here's an example of that from um, a paper that came out of an EC workshop 
uh, Mark DeRosa was the lead author on. So at the workshop, what we did was we looked at uh, magnetic field extrapolations using uh, a series of magnetograms constructed from Hanode data uh, for a given active region. And these magnetograms were constructed with different resolutions. Uh, and then we looked at the, the solution data cubes for the nonlinear, for different nonlinear force free codes using that boundary data. Um, and what this diagram shows is um, an, a decomposition of the um, a solution cube for the optimization method um, with, for the different resolutions. The different resolutions are on the horizontal axis. And then the different points correspond to the energies of components of the field. And so uh, using a Helmholtz decomposition procedure that Gerardo Valori came up with, you can, um, you can um, decompose the field into uh, solenoidal, divergence-free and non-solenoidal components, and also into current carrying and potential components. And so what the diagram shows uh, um, in particular is that the free energy in red, that's the, um, the energy of the current carrying solenoidal component is, is comparable at all resolutions to a non-physical energy associated with um, one component of the field, the mixed component of the field. So you can get errors in the free energies that you calculate um, if you have departure from uh, divergence freeness in your solution data cube, and that's what this shows. The second problem, you can get different results from different methods. Uh, so here is uh, our three nonlinear force free models for active region 12158 from the literature. Uh, the bottom left is the image that I showed on the first slide. That's, a, um, a that's an extrapolation done by Stuart Gilchrist. From, um, and then the other two, uh, other two extrapolations that are shown, um, uh, the, the authors are, are listed below. And so you can see that the, the first extrapolation bottom left has this rather beautiful twisted magnetic field structure that's not quite there in the other reconstruction. So you can, the, you can get differences in these models. There are qualitative differences. You can also have substantial differences in the free energies, for example, and other, other global um, uh, quantity, uh, properties of the solution. Okay, so the third problem that I identified, P3, you can get two different results from the same method. This is interesting. So um, the, with the grad Rubin codes, you, uh, you can construct solutions for uh, the values of alpha on the two different polarities. Um, and so we call these the P and the N solutions. And those two solutions may be different. Uh, here's an example of that for active region 12017 from the 29th of March, 2014. Uh, on the left hand side, the bottom is the P solution, on the right hand side is the N solution. And the P solution here reconstructs um, a, a twisted magnetic field structure that is consistent with um, a filament that's, that was observed in, in this region associated with an eruption. And the N solution doesn't, doesn't reproduce that. Um, so this is fairly typical of, of the results that you can get. Um, so one, one or other solution may reconstruct structures that are there in the solar that are observed in the solar atmosphere, be consistent with those structures. And also the, the free energies could be quite different for the two different solutions. So uh, a suggested approach to this within the Grad Rubin um, uh, um, with the Grad Rubin method is the self-consistency procedure. So you have those two different solutions, P and N, they give you two entirely different sets of values of alpha. Um, and so what you could do is take those values and average them subject to uncertainties in your alpha values. Um, and that would then give you uh, new values of alpha on the, on the P and the N polarities in the lower boundary. Uh, and so you can construct P and N solutions again, and you can iterate, you can continue doing this. And if you do that, you find that um, it, it will converge in general and the uh, at convergence, you're not getting a change when you do this, which means that the P and N solutions are identical. You've arrived at a self-consistent solution. However, if you do that, then if the boundary values are, are substantially inconsistent, um, then what you find is that the self-consistent solution is close to being potential. Um, and so uh, I, you can illustrate this um, with uh, just um, analytic boundary conditions. So this is uh, from a paper by Alpha Mastrano um, from uh, last year, illustrating this. On the left-hand side is a set of analytic boundary conditions for BZ, just a little bipole in the lower boundary. That's what you're looking at. The blue is positive and the red is negative. On the right-hand side is are the alpha values. 
And so what the alpha values imply is that in the P polarity, the current is parallel to the magnetic field and in the uh, N polarity, it's anti-parallel to the magnetic field. So these boundary conditions are clearly inconsistent. What happens when you construct your solutions? Well, here are the P and the N solutions for those boundary conditions. And so you, you end up with um, little bipoles with opposite sense of twist, the different sense of twist. And if you take those and then apply the self-consistency procedure, what you end up with is shown uh, at the right, you get essentially a, a potential field solution, very close to potential in this case. Um, but what Alpha investigated was what happens if you then weight your solutions in the two polarities, you, you assume different uncertainties to your Alpha values in the two different polarities. Well, what happens is you can get something that's closer to the P solution or closer to the N solution, depending on your weighting. What's shown here on the right is if you have a small, if you have smaller un uncertainties uh, in the positive polarity, then you end up with a solution bottom right, which is closer to uh, the P solution, has the twist of the P solution rather than the N solution. So in that way, you can adjust the solutions that you obtain. Um, in ideally, you, you would hope that the boundary values that the that, that the uh, uncertainties associated with your uh, alpha values from the solar boundary data um, are such that they give you the right solution when you do this, um, you know, something that matches the observations when you do the um, when you do your reconstruction, but that's not clear. So uh, here's this example again with active region one, two, oh, one, seven. Um, and what Alpha found was that if he, if he adjusted the weightings for the uncertainties such that he had smaller uncertainties for the, the regions of large current in the positive polarity, then he reconstructed the, the flux rope um, structure that's there. So this is a kind of a generalization of the, of the self-consistency procedure. Okay, I want to say something briefly more about the, um, the divergence problem. Um, so uh, I've identified that a departure from, from uh, divergence, the divergence free condition can affect the energy of the field and the free energy uh, in the field. Um, and you can uh, investigate that in, in considerable detail using the uh, Helmholtz decomposition procedure that I mentioned that Gerardo Valori is responsible for. However, that's a really, it's quite an involved procedure to do that. There's a really simple check on the, rely, on the uh, reliability of free energy estimate uh, as follows, if you decompose the field as is usual into a potential and a non-potential component, where the potential component has a, has a normal um, component matching the total field on, uh, all, on all boundaries uh, for your, your volume, um, then you can then construct two estimates of the free energy. One is obtained by uh, taking the square of the difference between the total field and the potential field and doing the volume integral of that. And the other one is obtained by the volume integral of the square of the total field minus the volume integral of the square of the potential field. And these two estimates will be the same if div B is zero and not if it differs from zero. And the actual relationship uh, is shown um, there that uh, the difference between them is a, is a volume integral involving div B. Um, so this is a really simple check then that you can do on, um, one check that you can do on, on your free energy estimates. So I really I recommend people always try this. Um, and then I was going to point out something else, and that is that there's a there's a kind of there's a standard metric that people use for uh, the departure from the force-free condition, the, the, the fractional flux metric that's shown in the first equation there, where the average is overall grid points in a computational volume. Um, uh, so it was pointed out by Stuart Gilchrist last year that this metric has a floor. It scales li linearly with the grid size, so it's smaller for smaller grids. Um, and it's 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 actually obvious when you think about it again. Uh, if you look at the equation at top on the right, then um, uh, around a particular grid point, div b um, will have some constant value, um, say, and then the actual value of b is constant as you you know decrease the size of a, a, a little a little data cube around the grid point. Um, uh, and, but then there's a factor of, del of delta x out the front, so it will scale linearly with the grid size. So you can correct that with a simple renormalization that Stuart pointed out. So I, I recommend that people also do that if they're using this metric, use the, um, the rescaled metric. The problem doesn't matter, of course, if you're just working on a fixed grid, but if you want to make comparison with uh, other estimates of the divergence freeness using the, um, this metric, then uh, you need to do this. 
Okay, I was going to talk very briefly about the flux rope insertion method, uh, which is has been used fairly wide, widely. So this involves identifying uh, filaments, usually manually identifying them, calculating a, a potential field from the normal component of the field in the boundary, in the lower boundary. Uh, and then the vector potential for your potential field is altered along the filament path to include a flux rope. So you can specify axial and poloidal flux whilst preserving the normal component of the field at the ends uh, at, the, at the lower boundary surface, the ends of your path. And then magnetofrictional relaxation is used to achieve a nearly force-free state. So this method uses only the normal component of the field in the boundary. It ignores the vector magnetogram information. So I've also always thought that's interesting. Um, it would be interesting to look to see how consistent the results are with the currents that you infer from vector magnetograms. But I couldn't find where people have done this in the literature. Uh, also, it's interesting to, to look at how the results compare with the nonlinear force-free extrapolations. Shown a few really nice examples of the application of the method here by uh, Antonia Sabchiva and by um, um, uh, Adli et al. There, uh, and um, it's it's clear that this result does produce some some pretty Im Im uh, impressive uh, reproductions of structures that are, that are inferred from coronal observations. Okay, I will speak also briefly about the magnetohydrostatic extrapolation, which I think is a promising new uh, new approach. Um, so a, a simple generalization of the nonlinear force free model that I mentioned already is the magnetohydrostatic model. You include, include a pressure force and gravity. Um, now, the, the, the methods used for the nonlinear force free case have been generalized to this set of equations. The optimization, grad, Rubin, and relaxation methods have been presented for these equations also. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention that the optimization method also over prescribes the boundary conditions in this case. Um, but it's the, it's the approach that's been the most widely developed and there's some, some uh, really nice new results from it in application to the balloon-borne sunrise IMAX data. Um, so this data is really high resolution data, 40 kilometres is the spatial resolution. And you need that kind of resolution to, to uh, model the low atmosphere from the data. And it's, the, it's in the low atmosphere that the pressure and the gravity forces are most important. So in that modelling, the um, by Zhu, Vigelman and Solanke, the uh, pressure boundary conditions, um, it's really hard to get pressure from the data. Uh, they were just replaced by an estimate, um, rely, um, assuming pressure balance in horizontal direction um, at the photosphere. And the density was also just uh, obtained assuming um, a constant temperature photosphere. So here's uh, an example of the results from the modeling from the Sunrise IMAX data. Um, showing the, the pressure and the density in the low atmosphere and also magnetic field lines from this magnetohydrostatic model and in, indicating that you've got closure of a lot of these low-lying magnetic field lines in that low atmosphere, which is an interesting property of the, um, of, of the transition region of the low atmosphere. All right. So that's all really all that I, I wanted to say. So I'll just to summarise the... Um, the coronal magnetic field extrapolation has, uh, in particular using a nonlinear force-free uh, method, has enabled many studies of coronal magnetic fields. Uh, the NLFFF modeling has become pretty standard, but there are still issues with it that I've talked about here, in particular inconsistency, and I've, I've presented ways to test for inconsistency and to handle it. Um, I've spoken briefly about other static modeling techniques, the flux rope insertion method and also the magnetohydrostatic um, modeling, which I think is a, a promising new approach. Um, and I'll point out finally that the magnetohydrostatic models will be enabled by the really high resolution DTIST observations as well. Um, okay, so I think that I will stop there. And I'll stop sharing my screen perhaps. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so uh, for questions, can we please have a show of hands? Uh, so the first question is by Arnab. Arnab, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, yeah, uh, so you pointed out that uh, these uh, vector magnetic fields at the photospheric level, what determine the problem of finding the magnetic field in the corona? And uh, and that's why you said that even different models give uh, different in results. And this is something intrinsic to the nature of the magnetic, uh, nature of the mathematical problem. So this difficulty is not going to go away in future. So how do you envisage the future of this field? Do you expect um, um, more improvements or 
we have to live with the kinds of models which we now have. So what is your, what is your uh, 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 guess about the future development? And I can ask a second related question. The second related question is that it is a less complete compared to magnetohydrostatic model. So how much error do you make by neglecting the this 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 uh, pressure gradient and and gravity terms compared to Lorentz force? Are they um, uh, estim that are these forces five percent, twenty percent, or fifty percent? How much error do you make? So uh, can you respond to these two questions? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Anup. They're really good questions. Um, so as far as the future is concerned, I mean, I think the future is the modeling involving more physics. So it is the magnetohydrostatic modeling and it is the, um, the data driven modeling. That's really the, you know, that, I think that's where we'll make progress. But to do that modeling, you really need good boundary conditions as well. And it's not clear that we have those. I mentioned the problem there of the lack of, of pressure boundary conditions, for example, from, from the observations. So that's a brief uh, answer to your first question. And then the, the second question, was specifically about the magnetohydrostatic modeling and the errors there. Uh, I think the errors, um, we don't, it's very hard to estimate. It depends, you know, it, it's a question of the error in what, in what quantity, that's, you know, that's one approach to answering what you're saying. But a, a second answer really is that we haven't done studies. I mean, there's been very little magnetohydrostatic modeling based on the boundary data, it would be a really good um, basis for an EC workshop to do, to look at the, you know, the actual, um, you know, to take the two different models and compare them in detail for, uh, for solar boundary data and look at the numerical uh, quantitative differences in the solutions uh, and what you call the errors, although of course you don't know the right answer, so it's hard to say that it's exactly an error. Does that answer your questions, Bartley, I hope? Oh, yeah, to some extent, but even uh, can you make a rough estimate of, uh, about how large the pressure gradient and gravity terms are going to be compared to Lorentz force term? Is well, you can, and you can do that at the different layers of the atmosphere, and they're, and they're substantially different at the photosphere, but they're very small, you know, the, the magnetic field dominates in the upper atmosphere. So you can certainly, you can certainly estimate that. Um, it's harder to say how that, what the effect that it has on the actual extrapolation, though. You know, you can estimate locally what the, you know, what what you expect the magnitude of terms is. Okay. Thank you. Vishal, you are up next. You can unmute yourself. Yeah. Thanks, Divyendu. Mike, that was a very nice talk. Uh, I so you might be talking about uh, the divergence B uh, discrepancy in various codes. But how would you mitigate this if you consider, let's say, a coronal hole, which is primarily unipolar? Uh, any comments on that? Well, the coronal hole, yeah, the extrapolation doesn't really work for coronal holes. You can't have non-zero values of alpha on those open field lines, if that's what you're saying. Yeah. Um, and then, so I don't think this, you know, I don't think the nonlinear force-free modeling is, um, you know, as useful for a coronal hole itself. Having said that, people have tried the global, global scale modeling um, but I think in the in the open parts of those fields, it's it's current free. Um, so that's I guess that's a partial answer to your question. I didn't really answer. Didn't really say anything about div b there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's 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 good enough for me. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Rajguru, I see the IAA solar physics host with the raised hand. Is that you? You can then go ahead and ask a question. Yeah. Uh, so I want to know that uh, for this magnetohydrostatic models, how this pressure is uh, you are calculating. So basically, the equation of state and uh, how you are incorporating the ionization level. So that is one question. And second is uh, for this divergence of B in, uh, inconsistency. Can we use some divergence uh, cleaning prescriptions here? Uh, so these are uh, two yeah. questions. Yeah, that's a good question. A uh, good couple of questions. Um, I mean, the modeling that I showed with uh, Zoo and Vigelman and Solanke, they're the, um, um, it's just a, a constant temperature at the photosphere is what they've assumed for the, um, for the density, to obtain the density boundary conditions. And then the pressure is just obtained by assuming a tra um, pressure balance in the transverse di direction. Um, so they're, they're just, uh, they're inferred boundary conditions that, are, that um, derive only from the magnetic field and the assumption of constant temperature. Um, I, I didn't quite understand the, how the ionize, you, 
the ionization part of that question. Uh, and then the div B, the divergence cleaning, yeah, that's an interesting idea. Uh, certainly with something like the, um, uh, the magnetofrictional method, you could use divergence cleaning uh, as you evolve the field. Um, the, uh, I think that the, uh, I mean, with optimization, they do, they, they do in the iteration process, they do have a term which, um, which you can tune to um, reduce div B. Um, so that's the, the generalization of that optimization method that Tomas Wiegelman introduced. In the Grad Rubin approach, it's um, that works from a vector potential, so it's not um, that's not required. Uh, I mean, one method, one approach to the, the magnetofrictional that can also use a vector potential. So in that case, you you don't need to do the divergence cleaning. The problem, it, it, I talked about it in the context of the optimization method because there you fix the lower boundary condition, the, the full vector field at the lower boundary condition, and that's got the div b non-zero built into it. You know, so you're not going to get rid of that if you don't change that lower boundary. Um, yeah. Since there are no more questions, let me squeeze in a question, Mike. Uh, uh, so one of the problems of uh, the approach where we use full MHD models or even a magnetofrictional model is if you have to insert a flux slope, we literally do it by hand in the sense that you sort of model it in. And uh, if you want to do full MHD or magnetofrictional models, you also need to incorporate a twisted flux slope. Now the problem is that if you want to calculate the twist of this flux slopes, then you, you you again have to go back to the force-free assumption uh, for calculating a twist based on the surface boundary, which is which is uh, determined from vector magnetograms. Um, so do you think we are losing something there in trying to insert a sort of a idealized flux tube or a twisted flux slope, which is measured in terms of a, a, a force-free condition applied on vector magnetograms into these MHD models? Um. I I wasn't aware that people really determined that twist based on the vector magnetograms. Do they really do that? I thought they, you know, you can choose the toroidal flux and the poloidal flux, and the poloidal one is the one corresponding to the twist, right? right. Um, and I, th I thought they just adjusted those to to um, to match other conditions that they wanted. Has it really? Are they really derived from the vector magnetograms? Do they? No, often they are. In the in, in the magnetofrictional models, typically like what has been developed by the St Andrews group, which is also used okay. by the Harvard group nowadays. I think they basically put an idealized uh, twisted flux slope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My and my. I mean, you, that's right. So they insert that and they choose these parameters. Um, I, I guess the question I, I posed there was was whether the parameters you choose are consistent with the force, for, you know, with the vector magnetogram data. You're telling me they are, um, which is interesting. I mean, they are to the busy component, and, and the rest are sort of, you know, almost free to tweaking or fine tuning. And that seems to me to be a continuing problem with, with uh, I mean, right. that's the best available, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the BZ is fixed by the by the method. Um, yeah. But, and the other ones are free parameters, was my understanding. Um, right. right. Yeah. And my understanding is that sometimes you do the magnetofrictional evol evolution and your flux rope goes away too, which is mm -hmm. interesting. <laughs> okay, I think we have Vuan Joshi also uh, has a hand raised. So we'll take that as the last question. Vuan, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Michael. Uh, Hello. So my question is about the detection of flux ropes, I mean, related issue. Uh, I mean, is what, what is the maximum height up to which we can have a reliable detection of flux rope structures in, in, this, in this modeling? Oh well, that's a difficult question. I don't know. Um, I mean, the, you know, these the the modelling is sort of active region scales. Um, so you know, so many times, ten to the seven meters or something like that. Um, uh, you know, you can get the, you can certainly reproduce flux ropes on that scale. The one the, the model that I showed with Stuart Stuart Gilchrist's um, uh, extrapolation was a very large scale flux rope. Um, I don't know if there's a limit to it. I, I'm not sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you, Mike, and I'll hand it over to Angshu uh, to move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Mike, for the talk. Let's have a virtual round of applause for him. We will take the discussion further if needed in Slack channel. So there is slight change in the schedule because our next speaker is not available online right now. So the next talk is by Dr. Ramit Bhattacharya from Udaipur Solar Observatory on the modeling and simulation of coronal magnetic structures and coronal transients. So please take the floor, Dr. Ramon.
Ramit, you are muted. Now we can't hear you. Yeah, uh, I yeah. see it. <laughs> yeah, can now you, you can hear you. <laughs> yeah, I was muted. Yeah, so uh, good afternoon. Uh, first, let me thank Michael for giving such a wonderful talk. And it almost covered all the aspects of uh, uh, extrapolation. So uh, I will be focusing mainly on modeling and simulation of uh, this coronal magnetic structures. By coronal transients, I mean an umbrella term, which is basically encompasses all the activities that we see, which are basically triggered by magnetic reconnection. So uh, these are my collaborators, my students, along with Professor Piotr Smolarkevich and Dr. Xiang Hu. So uh, to begin with the, the uh, thing is not sliding. Yeah. So uh, there is no need to really uh, define fear in this audience. But uh, I would rather say that uh, I would just give you the uh, classical definition. This is a sudden release of free energy stored in twisted magnetic field lines. And mark the word twisted. It is a must along with a change in the field line connectivity, which all can be encompassed or condensed in a single word, my magnetic reconnection. Okay, so this is a uh, flare at the limb. And this is a flare occurring on the solar disk. Now, there is a standard flare model. And let me show a animation from a simulation that was done in our group. Uh, here, uh, you can see that the animation starts from uh, sheared magnetic field lines. And as the plasma progresses, following magnetohydrodynamic equations, the sheared field lines reconnect, they generate a flux rope. And because of the, uh, because of the upflow, the reconnection flow, this magnetic uh, rope, it rises and actually stretches the overlying magnetic field lines. Now, the thing is, what we also do is we do data-driven simulations or data-constrained simulations where we extrapolate the magnetic field lines using a vector magnetogram. And I must point out that we necessarily do not use the nonlinear force free, but we use a model where uh, the plasma beta and the Lorentz force, I mean, both are non-zero at the uh, photospheric level and it falls off as you go up which happens in the actual sun. So, and also uh, I would like to point out that this kind of picture, I hope you can see my cursor, or let me change it to a, a pointer, laser pointer. So this kind of a flux rope is kind of a simplified scenario and there may be other structures, other topologies like magnetic neutral points or magnetic nulls, 3D magnetic nulls, which can effectively trigger a flare or any other transient phenomenon. So this is one example of a magnetic null. Uh, as you can see that magnetic field lines come, so magnetic null is basically a point where magnetic field is zero, so these magnetic field lines kind of try to avoid this magnetic, this particular point where the magnetic field is zero and give you this kind of a topology. So these talk of field lines are called uh, spine, whereas this plane is called the fan plane. This is pretty standard in definition of three-dimensional null. And this is an actual magnetic null, the bottom picture, which we have uh, kind of developed from vector magnetogram obtained from HMI. And you can see that this is the spine axis and these are the fan plane. And inside, if you look at the red colored field lines, this is a flux rope. So this is almost like uh, the scenario which uh, 
Alfonso was talking about yesterday. And you can see that this is a flux flow which is embedded in a three-dimensional null. The null is located somewhere here. And you can see the evolution here. And uh, kind of this is an image simulation. The thing turns out to be that the flux slope actually rises up. And as it rises up, it kind of hits the uh, magnetic null point over here, gets reconnected, opens up, and the plasma is ejected out. OK. So the point that I want to really emphasize here is that it is not a single or a simple flux flow. And please understand, this is not an embedded flux flow, as we were discussing a few minutes back. This is a flux flow which is obtained from the extrapolation itself. So the real scenario on the sun in the active regions may be pretty complicated. OK, having more than one topological structure that can generate you know, uh, magnetic reconnection and transient events. This is one more I would like to specify. Uh, you can see this uh, uh, flare occurring over here. And I would like to draw your attention to this fingering kind of motion. So you can think of this as fingers, which are kind of rolling over the surface. And if you look at uh, uh, the right-hand type of right-hand picture, you can see the same field lines. These are extrapolated once again. So on the surface, what you see is a vector magnetogram. And uh, you can see that these fingers are doing kind of the same oscillatory motion that is observed. And this is the simulation. And once again, there is a null at this point. There is a reconnection at the null, and the overlying field lines actually move upward. OK, just like what is expected in a flare. Now, let me take you to the next slide. Uh, this one is, once again, a coronal jet. It's a blowout jet, which is kind of a mini filament eruption. And you can see that uh, the eruption is occurring, the brightening is occurring. Uh, somewhere here, uh, then there will be an eruption. And we did numerical simulation for that. These are the magnetograms. So I guess uh, this is the actually obtained magnetogram. And this is the synthetic magnetogram that we have generated by extrapolation. The two doesn't uh, show much difference. So this is the simulation I would like to show you. So initially, you can see that there is a uh, yellow colored field lines, which are twisted and look like a flux rope here. And the ambient field lines are just like a 3D null. And as the flux rope rises, it reconnects in the 3D nulls, open up. And the whole plasma, like a sheet, flows up along with the, along with the ambient field, which actually kind of generates the jet. So this is something I think uh, we believe that this is the first uh, data constraint simulation which was done uh, for the coronal jet. And uh, uh, this is the actual reconnection which is occurring at the flux rope. You can see a development of a X-type neutral point over here. Now, with this much background, what question that question that I want to pose is that do we really expect this kind of three-dimensional magnetic nulls in nature? Uh, kind of assume that uh, just to just to impose my point, just assume that you have n minus one magnetic dipoles, and at the point P, the magnetic. Uh, magnetic nulls or magnetic reconnection, be it in a current sheet, be it in a magnetic null or QSL, these are all small scale phenomena. So the question in MHD is how small is small? So we did a back of the envelope calculation and kind of we showed this S is a Lundquist number. So one by S represents the diffusion or dissipation. So kind of we 
thought that, and delta is, by the way, the inertial scale, I have an inertial scale. So we kind of showed that if really you want to have dissipation in a system, okay, like a corona, okay. I don't mean the global corona. I mean the corona where part of the corona where the magnetic reconnection is taking place. At that region, if we really want to make this plasma diffusive, we cannot neglect the delta I. And we know that a finite delta I by L introduces the Hall effect. Now, this is a simulation, but this is a simulation with the initial condition, which is analytically derived. You can see the left side, which is the standard MHD uh, simulation. The right-hand side is the Hall MHD simulation. And you can already see that the Hall MHD simulation is faster. And I am not showing it, but we have found it also impulsive, something which is there in the uh, solar flares that we observe. So, and not only that, this is a cross-section of that uh, flux slope, which is generated by Hall MHD simulation. And you can see that this flux slope shows internal breakages. So the structures, the magnetic topology is much more richer. So now we are wondering kind of, uh, we are trying to work on what happens if I do a data-driven simulation with Hall MHD, okay? And we are really looking forward to the result. I can tell you the result is very encouraging, but uh, let's see how it comes out. So uh, that, that kind of brings to the end of my presentation. So just to summarize, traditional standard flare models may not be able to explain all flares, magnetic nulls, along with QSLs and hyperbolic flux tubes, which I have not uh, discussed, they play an important role and requires more focused research to explore the underlying magnetic reconnection because the reconnection is kind of different in these topologies. They're three-dimensional. Uh, there may be multiple reconnection topologies in a single event. Okay. And we need a holistic approach we need to kind of uh, we need to kind of consider all these topologies while interpreting the event, and then Hall MHD can describe the reconnection dynamics better, building richer structures and finer and faster evolution. So th thank you, and uh, certainly I'm going to thank you, Ramit. We are open for uh, questions, questions now. Yeah, Bhuvar, I see your hand raised. No, sorry, that was there since last hello? time. Okay. Hello. So, yeah, hello. 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 Uh, can I? Yeah, yeah go please. Ahead, go ahead. Okay. Uh, hello, Ramit. Yeah, hi. <laughs> so I just want to know at what height on the solar atmosphere have you. Calculate of P by omega Pi. Yes, yes, yes. So yes, at yes. what height, uh, what's the value of omega Pi you have used or what's the electron density, etc.? Uh, actually, uh, for this particular simulation yeah. that you are observing, uh, there, uh, there was no height involved because I have used a periodic boundary condition. But what would okay. it refer to, this delta of... Uh, um, 2.5 meters, where would it be applicable on the solar atmosphere? Yeah, it will go somewhere near, uh, so somewhere in the chromosphere, yeah. <coughs> so, and, and, and actually, uh, uh, you may rightly know that I am neglecting the ambipolar diffusion was there. So that also we are planning in future. So L would be something like 32 meter, whereas delta is 2.25 meter. L is 10 to the power minus no, 2. That's only. Fine. That's only I wanted to know at what height is it applicable. Yeah, so you may say that 
uh, all I can answer is uh, these are applicable for very small. Uh, hi, uh, myself Shahil from IIA. Can I yes, ask? Please. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I'm wondering in uh, this chaotic magnetic field uh, simulation. Yeah. So I want to see the how magnetic field energy is evolving with time. So does it saturate at uh, some point of time? And at that level, uh, does that magnetic field uh, um, feels attain this potential field-like structure? So something uh, like this is a very good question, actually. Yes, uh, these kind of simulations are kind of relaxation. Okay, so the idea is that you convert magnetic energy into kinetic energy, back convert kinetic energy into magnetic energy, and while doing so, magnetic reconnection and viscosity dissipate this energy out so that you ultimately reach a quasi steady state. Theoretically, you would reach a steady state, but numerically, you reach a quasi steady state. So have I answered your question? Yeah, so the following that, so if I try to uh, determine what kind of, uh, uh, so averaged magnetic field can be attained at the, at the, that quasi steady state. Is it kind of a unipolar direction, something like that, or it is like zero? No, it won't be zero. Uh, neither, it, this is kind of like this, the right hand animation that you see. Okay. So it will still kind of uh, have its uh, chaotic nature. Okay. Okay, okay. So gravity is imposed here, no? No, no, no gravity is imposed here. It is on the magnetic field. Okay. Gravity is not there, but a pressure is there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Krishna Prashad, you can go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, I just have a comment on uh, your definition of uh, solar flare that uh, observationally we just uh, look yes, at yes. Uh, the sudden brightening uh, and we assume that rest of what you said in the definition happens, right? So I just wanted to know your response to that. Sorry, uh, can you please ask me again? Uh, yeah, observationally, the definition of uh, solar flare, we just look at the sudden brightening and assume rest of what you said is happening there, right? Uh, yeah, that is true. But uh, yeah, so uh, I would say that there is a near consensus that uh, magnetic reconnection is the underlying process uh, because there is no other mechanism which can generate, uh, uh, you know, that much energy where you really emit X-ray, hard X-ray even. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that is, that, is, uh, that is the reason we kind of say that uh, magnetic reconnection is the reason for solar flare. And is the twist also mandatory because you- Twist is mandatory. Twist. Yeah, twist is mandatory because what <coughs> happens is that uh, during the flare, it is a magnetic free energy which is released. Mm -hmm. And this free energy is stored in the magnetic field lines in the form of twist. So no twist, no free energy, no release of energy and no flare okay. kind of thing. Thank you very much. Ramit, again, I'll just uh, button with the last question here uh, since you don't have any more raised hands. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that this models, in fact, most models ignore is the dynamics uh, of the boundary. Uh, in the sense yeah. that uh, the assumption here is that you 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 take a instantaneous magnetic field and and the hope is that the relaxation dynamics in the corona will give you give you a field that is that is that you expect to be fine. Yeah, oh, this is MHD this? simulation. Right. This is ignoring flux emergence. Um, yes. This yeah. Is a good way of incorporating the surface evolution, time dependent surface evolution in the boundary. Uh, to see if you know if that has an impact on the yeah yeah a lot the... actually actually the all the simulations that you have seen were selected such that the boundary flux is almost preserved okay but if you go to a real uh, data uh, data what they call it a driven simulation where they reconcile this flux emergence with their uh, with the simulation those gives a more realistic kind of uh, scenario and a better physics, I guess. Okay, so essentially you're forcing the boundary with, with the time dependent boundary and the yeah, you are, you are kind of reconciling your uh, simulated boundary with the 
magnetogram at different thank times. You. Okay. Thank you, Ramit. I think I'll hand it over to Angshu uh, for continuing yeah, with the session. So thank you very much. So let me. Thanks, Dr. Ramit, for the talk. Let's have a virtual upload for him. Uh, we can take the discussion in Slack if needed. So the next talk is by Dr. Naveen Joshi from SRM University, Delhi, who will be talking about sequential lid removal in a triple-decker chain of CME producing solar eruption. So Dr. Naveen, the floor is yours. Uh, okay, yes, I am here. You, yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. Please share your screen now. Is this visible? Uh, yeah, no, it's not in full screen though. Okay, let me. Okay, yeah. now it's fine? Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, thank you, Anshu. Uh, a very uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, this is uh, the sign of Veen Joshi. And today I'm going to talk uh, uh, something about the, uh, this, uh, the one of the mechanism that we, um, we are talking about like the sequential lid removal uh, mechanism. And uh, actually, basically, we are considered one of the observation. And then uh, we try to interpret this observation in terms of this uh, mechanism. And we have found some uh, observation signature of uh, some triple decker uh, magnetic configuration over there. So uh, these are my collaborators for this work, uh, Alphonse Ronald and uh, Bo and Joshi. So uh, a little introduction about the eruptions. Uh, we know uh, in the last few ta uh, two talks, we have discussing about the magnetic flux rope. Basically, in the observational point of view, if you see the magnetic flux rope can be observed. Observationally, we only see the filaments. Uh, and there's a twist in the filamentary material, uh, filamentary structures. So that is some of the observational evidence of magnetic uh, flux rope exists in the corner. Here, you can see one of the examples is there. <laughs> one of the huge uh, prominence system is there, which uh, prominence of filament are the structure that is uh, uh, hold by the magnetic flux rope uh, in the flux, according to the magnetic flux rope models in the corona. And these um, magnetic plasma, basically the cool plasma material, they're supported by the magnetic flux rope that you have seen in the last talks, the extrapolation seen some of the twisted magnetic field lines are there. So actually this uh, this kind of structure is remain uh, stable in the solar corona in the, <clears throat> uh, there is a balance between the tension force and the pressure force. Uh, of course, there is some rule of gravity as well. And when this equilibrium breaks, uh, they start to erupt. So uh, <clears throat> there are some models here. Quickly, I will go through it. So one of the model that was proposed is the flux emergence. Uh, here, here in the circular part is the prominence of the filaments. And if there is some emergence uh, from the bottom, so there is, uh, uh, the, so in in that case, uh, uh, emergence of uh, different polarities, uh, two point polarities. So they interact with the pre-existing, and there is a release of some uh, reconnection is there. Also, they produce some kind of uh, pressure difference. Uh, the magnetic pressure decrease here, so uh, the flux rope field lines come closer, and they reconnect here, and the flux rope the whole filament or the flux rope system goes away. And the second part, uh, the same emergence can be seen outside the uh, near, not uh, exactly uh, at the bottom of the polarity inverse line, but the sideways. You can see here in the sideways, the emergence is there and they are interacting with the outside magnetic field lines. So that is one of the uh, models that was given by uh, the chain and they later was developed uh, by other authors as well. Other model is the teaser cutting model. Here, uh, what's the difference is we have <laughs> the shared field lines that was um, supporting. Uh, these are the field lines that are uh, shared. They have some twists involved in it. And we have uh, filament or the uh, exists here in uh, uh, at this point. So when these shared field lines reconnect at the null point, uh, at the polarity inversal lines, so there's uh, some sort of uh, tension release. So it start to erupt. Later on, the process is, uh, is like uh, <clears throat> same as uh, the standard reconnection. We have a flux rope is going away and there's a reconnection beneath it. And we have a flare and flare low uh, uh, filaments, uh, uh, flare ribbons as well. Uh, the breakout uh, model is another important model that was uh, developed in the recent year. Again, here is there is some sort of reconnection. It is believed that there is null point in the higher corona and there's a reconnection there somehow. It's a long uh, taking process. And then when the null point, uh, which is in the corner, the connection is there. So we have the eruption of the underlying flux, which is uh, in the middle lobe. 
we have actually actually the quadrupolar magnetic configuration here in that configuration so uh, but uh, uh, what's my motivation is this uh, if there is a eruption from the same active region or from the same polarity inversion line so what kind of mechanism should be there and is there any uh, sort of uh, new mechanism we can uh, uh, discuss on so in that motivation uh, 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 what what i study that i took one of the events that was uh, there is we we, uh, we found three eruptions on the same polarity inversion line or the from the same active region and then uh, we uh, try to explain these eruption uh, phenomena with the help of uh, one of the model that is called sequential lead removal model and that was also um, uh, like proposed and discussed by the stalin in 2014 hmm. so uh, let's discuss something more about that so uh, we'll start with the movies here you can see first eruption second and the third these are from the so same active region or the same polarity inversion line okay so if there is uh, three eruptions one by another so there is a possibility that we sh should have the three flux row one over another or somewhere there and also in the different field of view, this is the studio A uh, movies, and this is the SDO movie. You can see second, and then this is the formation of post flare loops of the second, and then we have the third eruption from the bottom. And then we'll try to interpret what happens. So uh, the lead removal is uh, basically lead means the overlaying enveloped field line that is over the filament. Okay, so uh, here we are not discussing any kind of reconnection or the uh, pressure. Uh, uh, like we have the in the other models, but we are just saying that they are somehow removing. Okay, so removal of these kind of things we are discussing in our model. So like uh, this is the active region here uh, we have uh, it is in the western part of the sun, northwestern part, and uh, you can see the active region like this here. Uh, if you see the non, uh, we did some non-linear force-free field exabolition of this active region, uh, though it is in the limb, but uh, it nicely showed that the magnetic, the overall magnetic uh, photospheric configuration is bipolar. We have positive and negative um, field lines. Uh, and uh, the field lines is also showing the bipolar nature. So we have the inner field line as well as the long uh, O-length corner field loops and the low-length field lines. Okay. Hmm. So if you see the, the what will happen in the uh, X-reflex, X reflex of the whole uh, sun, then we can see there are three bumps uh, is, are there. Actually, we have, we observed, uh, we started our observation of this event is two, and it goes up to the uh, 24, uh, 23.23 23 UT uh, on 20, in between 21st May to 22nd May, 2013. So we can see three bumps. Okay, later we'll see that these three bumps are corresponding to these three eruptions that we have observed in this uh, events. Okay, so that is nicely matching. So uh, that is showing that at least we have some reconnection also involved in the is a polarity inversion line and initially at 2 UT, which is the starting time uh, we have used and is there we have uh, the active uh, filament. Uh, there is a starting of active filament. It is a uh, very low length filament and this is, this is going to be activated and then suddenly disappear, but it doesn't erupt. Hmm. But what it causes, it, uh, it disturbs the overlaying uh, magnetic field systems. So that's why this overlaying uh, filament flux rope is going to be moved upward. So these are not the uh, uh, flux rope, but is the overlaying field lines, that is the enveloped field line that is moving on it. So we have very close field, uh, uh, flare-like loops are there. So that, that we are interpreting that uh, there is some sort of uh, connection is also there. So that is the starting point. It, it started upon the two UT. Hmm. In the stereo field of view, we can also see in the difference images nicely the loop structures are there, which is very high, and it is going to be erupt. Okay, and its speed is 167 kilometer per second. In uh, Lasco uh, sconographic field of view, we can see the different kind of uh, CME. Uh, we can see some sort of uh, some eruption is there, but actually this is just the leading edge or some uh, faint structures are there. We can we can't see the full uh, very detailed uh, flux rope structures is there. So. What we interpret is in the in that case where we can only see the some eruption of overlaying field line, not uh, or the subshared field line, not like the proper flux rope or the filament structure. So how we can interpret these things is uh, 
Now we can see we have three eruptions, so there should be uh, the three flux of one over another. There should be lie something like this. So uh, here, uh, the the triggering the filament erupt, uh, filament activation in the first phase is the second flux row. So that is uh, that activation is going off the second flux row, which initially push the overlying field lines that. Uh, uh, makes the uh, the flux of one which is the top unstable and then it is going to be erupt. So when it's going to be up, there is a reconnection here in the very high corona and there should be two uh, set of flare ribbons we can see. One is due to the inner side, R1, R0, R1 and second is R1 and R2. Though this R1, R2 which is at the very far away, it is very faint structure we have found, but there is something there. Hmm. So this is so the lid that we are seeing is the blue and the red lines. These are the also in the systematic, we are seeing only three lines, but there may be more. So some of the field lines is going to be removed in that case, okay, from the second and third. Okay, so that may facilitate the okay, eruption of the second and third. Yes, sir? You have three minutes. Okay, fine. So that is the uh, eruptions. Uh, we can see in the second uh, eruption, it is at uh, 725 UT after the four or five hours later. So we only see the eruption of second uh, uh, flux row, which is initially arrested. Okay, so there we can see, it's a speed is like around 43. And the stereo, we can also see the nice loop like a structure that is going to be erupts. These are the flare ribbons associated with the second uh, uh, eruptions. And this is the post flare loop, fine. And this is the same structure, nicely three-part structure we can see. But in the first case, we can't, we can't see any filament uh, eruption structure, but here we can see uh, nicely the leading edge cavity and the core. So that is score two means corresponding to second eruption. So here what we can see the flux rope two, which is initially arrested, it doesn't erupt, but it's triggered the first EME. Now it destabilized somehow and it's going to be erupt. Okay, so when it's going to be erupt, the second lead, the field line, which is red, blue, and black, and including uh, some of the red field lines that are going to be removed from the third, uh, for the third flux row or the filament. Okay, again, we can see now the third uh, eruption is there from the same polarity universal line. Here we can see the third eruption, which is at 12 UT after a few hours later on, and its speed is around 40, uh, 47 is the slowest speed, and the highest speed is 176. We can see the nice flux of eruption here. So you can see the post flare loop of the second uh, phase is going to disturb when there is a third eruption. You can this, this is the deflection of the post flare loop from the second eruption or the second flare, and this when the third flare is given, it is deflected and also uh, moving away with the flexor. So that is the case. And this is a uh, two flare ribbons associated with the third eruptions. This is post flare loop for the third eruptions and nicely the CME associated with the third eruption. So that is a sequential sequence of eruption we have observed in this observation. And we see that the first and the second eruption remove some of the overlying field lines. That is, we are calling the removal of overlying field line. That is a real, real lid removal and the sequentially one by one. And that facil facilitated the eruption of the underlying second and the third uh, filament flux row configuration respectively. So that is again the third flux row and it is going to be erupts. And now we have the final, the third uh, flux row eruption. We have the third CM. So the conclusion is like, in that kind of configuration, we uh, we can say that there there should be a configuration like the three flux of one over another, and somehow the first, second, and third sequentially erupts, and the first the middle flux rope triggers the first uh, CME, which is the topmost, and then second CME erupts, uh, second flux of erupts, and finally the third CME is more faster, is erupting with the very faster speed, which is facilitated by the removal of uh, field line from the first and second eruption. So that in that way, the, the conclusion is that the, uh, in the successive flux of eruption phenomena, we can also uh, study such, such kind of thing where we have the removal of overlaying field line instead of some uh, the teether cutting or the null point or the breakout reconnection is there. So we have some other mechanism where we have the, only the removal of overlaying field lines and then that will call the sequential lid removal in that way. So we can, uh, means in the future, we'll, uh, we are trying to search some more observational evidence of such kind and we'll working on it at uh, 
how we can uh, go with that mechanism. Thank you very much. Uh, and if you have, uh, that paper is published, if you can go, uh, so in the detail you can find out there. Thank you. Thank you, much. Nathan. Uh, we are now open for questions. Raise your hands if you want to ask a question. Yeah, Rakesh. Yeah. Uh, hi, Navin. Nice talk. Uh, good to see you after a long time and also, mm -hmm. also as a faculty of SLM. So my question is uh, like uh, this uh, interesting event which you uh, like uh, report, but how frequent this type of event uh, uh, in the, have you any like uh, idea about it? Is it very rare kind of event or it is a very common? Uh, um, just, yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, the uh, like we have events where we have successive uh, eruptions one, two, and three, but uh, like uh, it depends on the, suppose the active region is uh, um, uh, is there, and we can see the two eruption even before we can see the two eruption one after another, and but if you see the see the long uh, uh, evolution of the active region, maybe we can find some more events or uh, that kind of events is also there, but we need to work out on it that if from the same active regions the successive eruptions are going on, is there any other kind of mechanism like this uh, sequential removal or other kind of mechanism are there to trigger the successive eruptions are there. These kind of eruptions are uh, occurs, but we need to find out and work. Yeah, I understand. Oh, no, my uh, second and last question is like, Rakesh, as you I think we need to move on. Sorry, I think. Okay, okay. Okay. we'll discuss place. later. In Slack. Okay, Rakesh, we can discuss yeah, later. We'll discuss later, fine. So fine. one hand raised from IA Auditorium, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. So, uh, hello. Uh, this is Vema uh, Naveen. So, Hi. This, uh, sequential wind removal, can we interpret this as a uh, successive injection of magnetic energy uh, in a time scale of a few hours? We can also do that, right? Suppose the uh, energy is keep injecting, okay? So then, yeah, the energy is keep injecting, then there is a flux uh, formation do happen, then that erupts. And again, uh, after that energy will again inject, the flux work again form. That in that scenario also, we can interpret this way, right? So how can we, the, the way you interpret is that the presence of the flux work uh, one, one above the other. So that is a kind of uh, double decker or triple decker like that. So, I, 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 so in this perspective also, we can interpret. So that's my uh, concern. Maybe you can, comment on that. Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, you are right. In that way, it is concerned. But if you'll see in, in my movie, if you'll uh, close, closely see the movie, the second eruption is not from the bottom or from the polarity inversion line. So it means the flux rope or some uh, field lines, uh, shared field lines already in the higher in the corona uh, that we didn't observe. Or uh, even in the first case also, the, the initial trigger of the filament is observed. But we can't see their uh, coronal interpart, uh, coronal like uh, the coronal uh, coronographic images. We can't see some signature of the flux rope is there. So uh, in that, we careful examination of the thing. Also, we need uh, we did we also analyze the magnetic field uh, at the polarity inversion line. We see the movies how the magnetic field in changing there. So we didn't find any much changes. Only the uh, bipolar structure is remain there. Even uh, there's no such uh, emergence or something like things we have uh, observed in the polarity inversion line. So that uh, some kind of observation evidence gives us the idea that uh, something, uh, uh, the, the over, over, overlaying removal of the some field lines may be the most probable phenomena for this case. However, I'm, I cannot um, deny the, the flux uh, injection also. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Navin. Let's move on. Angshu, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Naveen, for the talk. Uh, let's have a virtual upload for him. We can take the discussion to Slack if needed. Uh, so the next talk is by Dr. Vagish Misra from the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. He will be talking about mass low rate from the uh, sun over cycle 23 and 24. Uh, Dr. Vag uh, Vagish, please uh, share your screen now. Can you please see this? Yeah. Can you do full screen once? Is it okay? Is it visible? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, good afternoon to everyone. 
And thanks to organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my work on mass lasted from the sun over the last two solar cycles. And uh, here is the outline of my talk. So we all know that uh, there are continuous solar wind from the sun, the idea of which was given by Parker in 1958, and later it was confirmed by the in-situ observations by Luna spacecraft. And since then, there is a continuous observation by different missions, Venus probe, and then we have recently by Stereo and Parker solar probe. So similar to this, also there are uh, episodic mass ejections from the sun, and that is called coronal mass ejections. This uh, CME and the solar wind together form the heliosphere, which is a bubble in the in space, which uh, separates the region around the sun from the interstellar medium. So similar to the sun, other stars have also been found to be giving wind and CME. They are called stellar wind and stellar CME. One observation of uh, solar wind, the, like the wind from the star, has been shown here. This, by the in the left side of the this panel, left panel by the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is a star in its old provide phase at the end of the page, and we can see that the solar wind has been nicely imaged. It has been also studied that different stars in during the different evolutionary phase have different rates of mass loss. Like the G-type star generally have the mass loss around 10 to the power minus 14 solar mass per year, and then the, like the star which is shown here, like all Freud star has very huge solar mass, loss, very uh, huge mass loss rate from the wind. And also, although there are no, there is not, there is not enough observation of uh, stellar CME, but uh, there are enough spectroscopic evidence that uh, similar to the sun, other stars also have CME. And this has been confirmed from the X-ray spectrum and X-ray light curve obtained from the stars. And it has been uh, generally believed that uh, like on our sun, the stars also have X-ray flare and uh, they are generally accompanied by some CMH. So this is the assumption, but uh, there are spectroscopic evidence. So what motivates me to study this mass loss rate from the sun is if we understand the solar mass loss rate, we can try to understand over different scale from other stars also. Since this mass loss is very important as they affect the planetary magnetosphere and atmosphere, it is important to, to understand its rate and its uh, variation over solar cycle. Moreover, the, we need to also understand the latitudinal dependence of mass loss rate because if a star loses heavy mass from its higher latitude, it would not uh, be slowed down enough and it will continue giving more ejections because of the angular momentum. So, in the absence of stellar CME and wind, we should look at the sun and then try to extrapolate these observations for the other stars. So for the sun, we know that uh, we have a solar cycle which varies on 11 year, which shows the 11 year, 11 year periodicity. And then there is a debate that solar cycle 24 is weaker in terms of uh, different parameters like convection zone flow and the solar surface and heliospheric parameters. So we can see that um, the most of the debate is centered around that sunspots are observed less in number in the solar cycle 24. However, there is also a need to see that whether the sunspot less has been translated into the same manner for the occurrence rate of CME or solar wind mass loss rate or the background X-ray luminosity. Once we study the sun in terms of background X-ray luminosity, these observations can be utilized for the other stars from where we can of course, measure the X-ray flux for some of the stars. So I will focus my talk in the for the solar cycle 23 and 24. So if we see the number of CME rate from in the last two solar cycle 23 and 24, there is already debate that um, in the solar cycle 24, although the sun spot number has been decreased at least around the half, like 40%, but the rate of CME has not been decreased that much. So this was uh, debated and there are several papers, but we can see that um, most of the debates are around whether the observation of the number of CME is real or it is an artifact due to change in the uh, manual observer which uh, notice the CME and catalog or whether there is algorithm dependent change because different automated catalogs are also there and different automated catalogs may have different algorithm to mark and identify the CME. 
So it is possible that manual catalog may miss some of the CMEs, narrow CMEs, while the automated catalog, depending on the algorithm, it can detect few of the false CMEs. So similar to CME rate, if you see the ICME rate, it is also not at least decreased significantly in the solar cycle 24. So what's going on? Why the solar cycle 24 is showing not much decrease in the number of CME at least? So at this, this problem, there are some studies and one famous study is by Gopal Swami, which uh, have uh, taken the expansion speed of the CME in the last two solar cycles and have found that the CME in solar cycle 24 are expanding with faster rate and that's why we can see at least more number of hello CMEs in the solar cycle 24. He is studying it for the hello CME. What I try to do is, I try to adopt a physically more meaningful approach where I am not trying to just count the number of CME, but let us take the mass loss total from the CME. When we take the mass loss from the sun, the narrow CME effect would be very less on the total mass loss. So they would be like uh, not of much significance, the narrow CME. So since the sunspots are mainly located in the mid latitude and low latitudes, so I try to look the CME mass loss from different uh, latitudinal pins. So in the plots, we can see that there are three plots. One, the CME mass loss from the minus 30 to 30, and then we have a um, CME mass loss from minus 60 to to plus 60 degree latitude, and then we have minus 90 to plus 90 degree. What we see that as we take the higher latitudes, higher latitudinal means, it means the total number of CME, the correlation coefficient between sun sports number and CME mass loss is becoming better. I try to make a relation between the sun spot number and uh, CME mass loss rate dm upon dt, and the expressions are here. So if you see here from this expression, it appears that the, num the CME mass loss rate is around 10 to the power minus at least 16 solar mass per year. See, so what is the, um, so even in this plot, if we see the number of CME mass loss in solar cycle 24, it's not decreasing that much as, in de as there is decrease in the sun spot number. So at this, this problem, I took another solar wind proxy and that is the background X-ray luminosity. And since the X-ray luminosity have high dynamic length, it, give, it can give more um, insight into the problem. So when I background solar X-ray flux and then the background X-ray luminosity, what I do is I exclude the flux contributed by all the flares. It means any data point in the both X-ray flux above 10 to the power minus 6, I have excluded them. And since and it can be assumed that there are some studies that this background extra luminosity will be mainly governed by free free bremer's law or line emission from the heated plasma in the closed magnetic groups. So if we see the correlation between mass loss rate from the CME and then the solar extra luminosity, the background luminosity, we can see that the correlation is at least improved. And there is not uh, much, uh, the CME rate in the solar cycle 24 doesn't look much increased in compared to the so solar X-ray luminosity. I try to fit this relation, the linear relation, and from this relation, I, we can again see that uh, solar wind mass loss rate in terms of X-ray flux can be well fitted into a simple function. Such function can be utilized for other stars if we know the X-ray luminosity from them. So it is also important to see that uh, what is the solar wind mass loss rate because CME are only as episodic events and although there is a continuous solar wind. So it is possible that the solar wind at least for some stars may contribute significantly than the, than the CME mass loss rate. So to, to, to do this, I um, utilize the in-situ observations taken at one AU. And what we see here that uh, solar wind mass loss rate doesn't show much dependence on the solar cycle, at least the number of sunspots and also on the X-ray luminosity. And if we try to uh, see the magnitude of this mass loss due to solar wind, we can see, the, see that it is at least one order higher than the CME mass loss rate. And um, although there are some intracycle variations, which I have not looked into detail, but it is possible that uh, the uh, intracycle variations are due to open and closed uh, magnetic field regions as the solar wind is not very much continuous. One, one very important assumption to study the mass loss rate via solar wind is that uh, what I have adopted that solar wind mass flux from all the solar surface is the same. And it can be safely assumed because um, high speed solar wind have uh, less density 
and the slow speed solar wind have a de are denser but with lower speed so if you see the mass flux from um, from the slow solar wind and fast solar wind they will probably will be equal so this is the one very important assumption goes in this study and then i try to estimate the relative contribution of cmh uh, minutes okay okay thank you so i also try to estimate the relative contribution of cmh to solar wind so in the left panel we can see that the contribution in the ecliptic plane is that only 5% at the maximum of the solar cycle while at the minimum of the solar cycle it is around 2 or 1 or 2% i also extrapolated this study for the other heliospheric latitude and i what we find that um, solar wind contribution the cme contribution to solar wind is again very less at higher latitude and one in the ecliptic only five percent even during the maximum of the solar cycle so we can see that at least for our sun the contribution of cme to solar wind is very less for other star it can be different and we need to further uh, look into the details one important assumption in this um, study is study which i made that uh, i have taken the apparent latitude of the cme uh, estimated from the central position angle projected in the open of sky and uh, I have expanded the CME into the heliosphere and the measurements at 1 AU, the density measurements at 1 AU has been taken, considering that the CME mass is uniformly distributed into the CME structure. Then the results, if I summarize what we see that in solar cycle 24, the solar wind mass loss rate is only decreased by 10%, the CME mass loss rate decreased by 15%, while the sun spot number, if we see, it has decreased by 40%. So we can clearly see that the decrease in the sun spot number has not been well translated into the mass loss from the either CME or solar wind. This is possible because the sun spots mainly show the generation of the magnetic field at the photosphere, while the CME mass loss or the solar wind mass loss are from the higher level corona. And the transportation of uh, this magnetic flux from photosphere to corona may be slightly different in the these two solar cycles. It is also, I forget to mention that from our study, when we did the latitudinal beam study of the CME, we find that in the solar cycle 24, there are several CME from the higher latitude. And this increased rate of CME, massive CME from the higher latitude started from 2003. It means the mid of the solar cycle 23. And this has to be very clearly, very because why there are more heavy CME from higher latitude since 2003? And one reason for this probably is that there may be weakening of polar, polar magnetic field and that is enabling any CME move like ejecting from the sun easily. So there are much study need to be done in this direction and we need to establish why this latitudinal dependence of mass loss is there, why and how it translates to the torque applied on any star or even on the sun in the longer, solar, longer time scale. And we need to examine that um, whether the present study for the sun can be extrapolated to the other solar type star at least. And um, the reliability of such extrapolation should also be looked carefully. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Vagash. Uh, the session is the open for questions. I see a hand raised from, let's see, Rakesh. Uh, yeah, hello. Rakesh? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Vagish, uh, nice talk. Uh, so uh, my question is like uh, in my work in uh, filament, I see uh, very uh, co uh, uh, correlated behavior of uh, number of filament and as well as this latitudinal dependence and cycle variation of the filament numbers. So while you are saying this uh, mass loss is no, could not be related with the sunspot, so could it be related to this uh, 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 filament and uh, like the uh, larger in the uh, large scale magnetic field which uh, generates uh, the filament? Uh, probably you are right that we need to account both this uh, sunspot and filament structure to know the mass loss right. from the sun. And in the solar cycle 24, if you see the catalog, the yeah. filament are more in the in solar cycle 24. The higher exactly. Filament. Yeah, that was my intent. Yeah, Hari, uh, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hello, Vagish. Uh, it was a nice talk. So uh, at the start of the talk, you mentioned that uh, you may be able to extrapolate uh, the mass loss rate to uh, other flash, flash stars and other stars. 
So uh, would you be able to do that with this solar scaling relation or uh, and if, if so, uh, how accurate do you think uh, such an application would be? Um, actually, if we assume that the X-ray flux during the reconnection is related to the CME mass, at least for the sun, it is established very well. So I think we can simply take the scale up for this uh, relations and study the other stars, right? If I am right. So Hari, I just uh, like to comment here. I think that uh, the solar wind mass flux is not trivially related to the sunspot number, uh, as for our understanding. A lot of studies has been done on this, and I think it's believed that the open, the, the balance of the open field lines and the closed field lines played a very important role in, in the solar wind mass loss. Uh, so just to, just to compare the solar wind mass loss to indices of X-rays or, or sunspot numbers may not be a good idea. You might want to use PFSS extrapolations if you're doing long-term studies and, and look at the source surface distribution of open versus closed flux. Uh, and this is particularly important when you go to very active stars, where, where there is a much larger filling factor of active regions, uh, where, of course, is you know when the, the mass flux mass loss rate will not be linearly related with the with the amount of flux that the, the star is producing. Uh, so one has to be a little careful in terms of interpreting the physics and then then moving from there to concluding certain things about the mass loss connection with the magnetic output of a star. Yeah. Right. Yeah, thank you. But for the CME, it should be valid, stellar CME. So that may be the one. Yeah, except that there has been no stellar CME which has been observed, right? Yes. Uh, at least there's no confirmed uh, observation yet. Yeah, we have not observed in bright light, but there are X ray flares have been observed, and the spectroscopic yeah, sure. if in few lines say that there are mass ejections from the stars. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, so I don't see any more raised hands. So with that, I will hand it over to Anshu to close the session with the closing remarks. Anshu? Yeah, thanks, Devendu. Uh, thanks, Dr. Vagpesh, for the talk. Uh, let's have a virtual applaud for him. Uh, if needed, we can take the discussion further to Slack. So we thank all the speakers for the wonderful talks. We also thank the participants for attending the session despite being in so many different time zones. So, yeah. Do you want All to right. say something? Uh, thank you, Angshu. I think we'll hand it over to the organizers if the if the uh, if Rajguru has some comments. Yeah, sure. So, so since the sessions are running late, so as we announced earlier, the next session will start at two fifteen IST, two fifteen PM Indian Standard Time. So the previously announced schedule was two PM. It got shifted by fifteen minutes. So I will close the Zoom meeting now. We will reopen. 15 minutes prior to 2.15. So, so see you all after about an hour. Stop.